The story begins on the day when there was a severe thunderstorm. A guy with a menacing expression sat on the throne and looked straight ahead at the girl who was sitting on the floor in front of him. With a chain around her throat, she turned to the master and asked if she could ask a question. He asked what the question was. In response, the girl asked how he was going to kill her. At that moment, the guy froze. He tensed when he thought that he had never even thought of killing anyone. He didn't know what to do. He didn't understand at all how he should talk to the girl he loved. It all started that day. The girl loudly begged me as to stop. With a terrifying smile, the man walked towards the girl while she was trying to bring him to his senses. He looked at her and tried to catch her, after which the girl screamed loudly. She hit him in the face, but the man's skin slipped behind her hand. She said with horror that he was not Mia's. She asked who he was. The next moment, an unknown person cut her clothes. The girl began to cover herself while the unknown was saying how languid her face was. He apologized and said that he was not going to touch her, because such girls are in the price of magicians. The skin from the face of a living innocent girl is a great catalyst. He told her not to die. The girl began to scream and resist, while the man said that everything would be fine, and she should not worry, because as soon as he finished with the face, he would take care of her. Suddenly, someone caught him by the head. The master lifted the man into the air while the magician asked in amazement what was going on and who the guy was. The guy said he should be the one asking the question. He asked how they dared to make noise in his garden. He was almost asleep when they made a noise. The magician was scared. He realized that everything was bad, because this is the territory of that guy. He shouted that they were both magicians, and he could share the results of his research and leave. Blood splattered on the girl's face. Noticing this, the guy panicked a little. The girl lost consciousness and fell to the ground. The guy panicked even more. He tried to calm down because he is a magician, and he can fix everything. He waved his hand, creating a circle of appeal. In an instant, the blood from the girl's face, as well as the torn dress, began to swirl into a funnel. Along with this, the mask on the wizard's face began to return to its place. He thought that he could only restore blood and flesh, but without clues, the girl might think that it was just a dream. He looked at the girl closer and noticed the cruciform coat of arms. He assumed that she was from the church. The false apostles of God are the natural enemies of magicians. Noticing this, he looked calm. He thought it probably didn't matter. This was his territory. There are many barriers around, detecting, reinforcing, protective, and even worse. A simple magician cannot intercept his sigil. Suddenly, someone appeared behind the guy. He looked calm. The guy said he shouldn't intercept other people's signals on a whim. Barbaros came to him. With a big smile, he greeted his friend Zagan. Barbaros said the guy was pale, as always. Zagan looked at him and thought that Barbaros was talking as if he were a pink baby. Barbaros saw the girl and gasped, thinking that he had interrupted the party. Zagan said that he got rid of the scoundrel who made a noise in his garden. Barbaros grinned and asked if Zagan was talking. He said they were magicians, scoundrels by definition. They take people's lives in pursuit of the only goal, to gain more power without a shadow of guilt. He looked at the girl and said that she was just overflowing with power. He asked if he would sacrifice her. Zagan said that magical sacrifices are not his profile. He created a magic circle and took the girl somewhere. Barbaros said it was a waste, and if Zagan didn't need it, then he could give it to him. The guy told his friend not to kidnap people on his territory, because he would be considered a criminal. Barbaros said he was pleased to hear that, and he would try it next time. Zagan got angry and told Barbaros to try and he wouldn't leave a stone of his castle. Zagan sighed and said that he had gone to bed, and if Barbaros had any business with me, then they should discuss it later. Barbaros ran after him and said that it was not necessary to do this, because he had gone so far to come to a friend and tell him something interesting. He grinned and said that if Zagan wanted to sleep, then he should add adrenaline to his blood. Zagan said that's why Barbaros looks like a dead man. Manipulation of the body is the basis of being a magician. They are not afraid of illness or imminent death. Barbaros said that for a millennial, it is. He added that he brought interesting news. Zagan immediately turned around. Barbaros asked a friend if he had heard about the demise of Marcosis, one of the demon lords. Zagan was surprised. The demon lord, the bearer of this title has great power. Those who stand on the edge of magic and those who can calmly bend the lower magicians to their will. Zagan had heard that one of the demon lords had recently passed away. Barbaros hugged his friend and noted how interested his face was. He reminded me that Zagan was going to go to bed. The guy told Barbaros to stop and get down to business. He asked if Zagan had heard about the city of Kyanid, after which he said that Marcosis had long declared it his territory and now an auction was being held there, which would take place today. 
It will sell legal items, as well as their favorite toys. Zagan tensed up and asked if Barbaros meant what he thought he meant. Barbaros exclaimed that this was it. He said his legacy would be auctioned off. More and more people were gathering in the city. People of different races, as well as employees, were in the city at that time. Barbaros wanted to say that he was trying to convey to a friend. Zagan said that, in other words, he had come to borrow money from him. He asked if, in that case, the legacy of Marcosis would belong to him. Barbaros asked why he was doing this, because he was the only one who told the guy about the auction. Zagan told the guy to find someone else. Barbaros exclaimed that no one else would give him money so easily. Besides, Zagan will be able to choose a woman for himself, or maybe two. Zagan thought about it. It wasn't that he was interested in them. It just seemed to him that they would get in the way more. Barbaros continued to beg his friend, so Zagan had to agree. Zagan noted that the situation in the city is unusually tense. Barbaros suggested that some fools were choosing women for a magical experiment. Zagan was surprised by another sacrifice. He said that such a thing would quickly attract the attention of the church. Barbaros said they even started abducting women based on their origin, like their date of birth. Zagan thought it was like summoning a demon, but it was just a silly dream. Barbaros said they probably consider Zagan their own. The guy said it was stupid. He didn't understand what they hoped for with such magic when there were no victims at hand. Barbaros laughed. Barbaros said that if you think about it, Zagan doesn't even have a friend to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with. Zagan grinned and thought that he didn't need friends. After a while, the auction began. People called big bets by buying different things. The guys were sitting in the back. Barbaros told a friend to take a look. He pointed out different people like Kamaris, the Edge of Darkness, the Temptress Gamora, and even the all-seeing Veilfar were there. Zagan asked if they were strong. Barbaros confirmed this and said that they were also candidates for the position of Demon Lord, just like both of them. The auction host said that the next lot is the last one for today and is the pearl of the collection. Initially, this product was intended for Marcosis, however, due to his death, it is put up for buyers. Barbaros was upset by the lack of Marcosis legacy. Zagan said it looked like another reagent. The presenter tore off the mantle from the product. There was a cute girl underneath it. The presenter said that this legendary creature captured in the holy lands of Norden is an elf. Seeing her, Zagan was stunned. The presenter said that this is a woman of the highest quality. She is suitable not only as a ritual sacrifice, but also as a servant of carnal pleasures. He also noticed the girl's white hair. They can do whatever they want with it. There were no tweaks or dyes, and this is her natural hair color. He said he could start with 10,000. Suddenly, someone in the audience said that they would take it for a million. Everyone turned to this man in shock. Barbaros looked at his friend in amazement. Zagan confidently said that he would give one million in curate gold. The presenter thanked the guy and said that it was a very impressive price. Barbaros started shouting that even for an elf it was too much. However, Zagan was fascinated. He didn't know what kind of feeling was in his chest. If you try to put it into words, she was beautiful. He wanted to help her, to see her smile and touch her skin. Zagan said that there was something in her that he wanted very much, and he finally found it. Barbaros exclaimed, asking what kind of ritual Zagan was going to use her in. The guy glared at his friend, after which Barbaros turned pale. Zagan went down to the stage, where the presenter congratulated the guy, saying that he was becoming the owner of a white-haired elf. The girl stared at the floor in silence. Zagan didn't know what to do or how to handle her. He didn't know if she was okay or if she was under someone's influence. The presenter asked if Zagan was feeling unwell. The guy noticed the chain around the girl's neck and asked what it was. The presenter said that this collar seals her magical powers. There is a possibility that she will escape if Zagan takes it off, so he needs to be careful. The presenter said that they didn't even know how to take it off, because it was a relic of the demon lord. Zagan thought about it and asked if the girl was conscious. The presenter confirmed this. The elf was in her natural state after being captured. Moreover, her incredible power is so great that it is impossible to harm her with simple magic. Zagan said he would take my word for it. The guy turned around and said that it would be extremely sad if she couldn't shed a sound with her sweet voice. He thought that the first thing he needed to do was talk to her. The whole hall was horrified by the ban. The elf just looked at him in silence. Zagan didn't understand at all why everyone was reacting like that. And that's how they came to the fact that the girl was asking how he would kill her. She said that if she knew, then she would be able to prepare properly. Zagan jumped up and said that he had no intentions of taking her life, and vice versa. Her death was not in his plans. The girl became more gloomy and asked if this meant that she could not hope for an easy death. The guy was shocked and thought that all the objects of torture belonged to the previous owner of the castle. 
He sat back on the throne and introduced himself. He said he was a magician, but such things were not in his area of interest. He was thinking about what to say next. The girl apologized for the late performance, after which she said that her name was Nephilia. Zagan thought she had a lovely name. He asked her what her last name was, but the girl didn't have one. The elf said that if her name was difficult to pronounce, then he could just call her Nephi. He happily asked if it was true. She confirmed it. Zagan thought that her name was beautiful in itself, but Nephi also sounded sincere. He asked if it was common for an elf not to have a last name. The girl said that this was not the case, and all because she was a cursed child. Zagan was surprised. Nephilia asked why the host was asking this question. He wanted to answer, but she said that he could be sure that she was innocent. Zagan was shocked. He asked if she had any idea what she was talking about. The girl was surprised and asked if he was not evaluating the experimental material for damage. Zagan said that she should understand him correctly, because his plans did not include experimenting on her. Nephilia asked what it was bought for then. After a short silence, Zagan said that she wasn't supposed to know. He didn't understand what kind of nonsense he was talking about. He thought that buying it at auction because he fell in love at first sight looked decent for a bad person, no matter how you look at it. After all, they couldn't live together without her seeing him as that kind of person. Suddenly he thought that he would live under the same roof with this unfortunate girl. He tried to calm down, because this is not typical for powerful magicians. He said they should choose her room first. He said she could choose the one she liked. The girl asked if she could really choose where to die. Zagan screamed that he wasn't going to kill her. The girl said she did not understand how the owner planned to use her, how it could not end in death for her. Looking at Nephilia, he remembered himself as a child. He said he only bought her because he needed her, so the subject of her death is closed. The girl looked at him and asked in shock if the master really needed her. The guy said that it was so, and the reason was that she had to lie for his sake. Nephilia was shocked. She stood up and agreed. This was the beginning of their long life story. Walking through his castle, Zagan snapped his fingers and turned on the light. Speaking about the room, the guy asked Nephi how she tolerates height. The girl said that she calmly endures both hanging by the neck and by the hands. Zagan asked who was talking about this. Nephi apologized and said that this was the first thing that came to her mind when it came to height. He thought that she had been raised to become a test rat, and perhaps this behavior was expected. While they were walking up the stairs, Nephi stumbled and almost fell, but Zagan quickly caught her. He exclaimed to her to be careful, because the steps there are steep. The girl agreed. Zagan held her hand and led her. Suddenly, he realized what was happening, and he blushed. He thought it happened when she stumbled and almost fell. He noted that it was too late to let go. They reached one of the rooms and Zagan said that he doesn't use this room at all, so it might be a little dirty. As soon as he opened the room, he saw a huge guillotine. He immediately slammed the door. Nephi was depressed. She told him to do as he pleased. Zagan exclaimed that she had misunderstood, and it was definitely a trap for thieves. It was too stupid an excuse even for him. He created magic and said that he did not need this item, and only took up space. He decided to clean up a bit. Immediately after that, an explosion occurred in the room. The door fell out, and only a black spot remained in the room. Zagan thought it was hard to say if the room could be used as a bedroom, but at least he had removed the inventory that had scared Nephi. The girl said with horror that it was the first time she had seen such destructive magic. Zagan tensed, because of course she would be scared if he suddenly used combat magic. His constant communication only with Barbaros led the guy to an extremely bad habit. He said it wouldn't do, and it was too corny. Nephi asked if this could be considered trivial. Suddenly the girl saw something and went forward. She went out onto the balcony. Nephi stared at the moon intently, then stretched out her hands towards it. Zagan asked if she liked the moon. The girl dropped her hands and said she didn't know. After that, the guy also pulled his hand towards the moon and said that he had not caught it. Nephi said she thought so. She continued to stare at the moon. After a short pause, she asked if she could stay in this room. Zagan turned and looked at the charred room. He asked if Nephi would be comfortable there, because they could find a better room. The girl said that she liked it, because, after all, this room was prepared for her by a master. Zagan agreed and said that the room was at Nephi's disposal. The girl thanked the master. Suddenly Zagan was surprised. Nephi asked what was wrong. The guy said that he had not heard words of gratitude for a long time. The girl said she hadn't thanked anyone for too long either. Zagan noted that he had heard her, after which they continued to look at the moon together. After a while, the sun began to rise. Tired, Zagan sat on the throne, 
thinking that he couldn't sleep even for a second. Nephi was sleeping on the floor next to him. He thought that it was simply impossible to do nothing when such a defenseless girl was sleeping next to him. However, he would not have had the courage to do anything. He didn't want her to hate him. Nephi slept there because of the condition of the room. Zagan thought that he needed to find something to eat. The sun was already high, and Nephi woke up. She got up and noticed that there was no one in the room. She carefully folded the blanket she was covered with. When she finished, Zagan came. The girl wished him a good morning. Zagan noticed that she greeted him, but he did not know what to say to him. He thought about answering as well. However, he suggested that he could wish her a good day. However, he did not think that such an answer would be appropriate. After a long pause, he menacingly said that he had brought food and she should eat. He immediately felt bad because he couldn't even greet her. He sat down on the floor and began to chew his food. Along the way, he wondered when he had become so useless. He assumed that he had been like that from the very beginning. Noticing that Zagan was eating it, Nephi asked in amazement if he was going to have the same breakfast that she was eating. The guy was surprised and asked if it was really strange. Nephi hesitated and said that this was not quite true, and it was an honor for her to receive the food. However, seeing the master eat the same food was a little strange for her. Zagan was looking at the girl in surprise when it suddenly dawned on him. He looked at the dried meat and milk that he had brought and asked if it could be too meager food. Nephi said a little nervously that this kind of food is usually given only to ministers. Zagan realized that, in other words, it wasn't even food, but only animal food. Zagan wondered if she was worried about him instead of being angry. He thought that this was unlikely, and it suited her very well to say that the guy would die if she did nothing. He became even more nervous. He took a piece of dried meat out of his mouth and thought that it couldn't even be called food. He somehow didn't pay attention, because it was a familiar meal when he was a tramp. He looked up and said out loud that he was wondering what normal people would eat then. There was sadness on his face. Noticing this, Nephi tensed up a little. She swallowed hard, then said that it might seem rude on her part, but she really wanted to ask if she could cook something for him. Upon hearing this, Zagan jumped up in shock. He asked in surprise if she could cook. Nephi said she was only watching from the sidelines, but she can try. Zagan blushed deeply, thinking about the homemade food from Nephi. He always thought only about his research and never bothered with such trifles, but he almost couldn't believe that he would be able to taste food from the girl he loves. He took a deep breath, then stood up resolutely and said that he had decided where they would go. The girl obediently agreed. Zagan exclaimed that they would go shopping in the city. At the exit, the coachman said that he could take the guy to the nearest city for only three bronze coins. He asked if they would go. Suddenly, the guy realized that he had forgotten something. He had absolutely no money left. He told the driver that he could take a walk once. There was a scene in his head of how he gave a million gold pieces for Nephi. Zagan was thinking that he needed to get money very urgently. Together they walked along the road in the forest. Upon returning to the castle, he could not find a single coin. He thought that he could sell the instruments of torture, but even to call an appraiser, he already needed a decent amount of money. He thought about how he should have attacked the wagon and robbed them. When he thought about it, only one thing stopped him. He turned and looked at Nephi, who was silently following him. He didn't know what she would think of a man who was acting like a robber. It only meant that the attack was cancelled. He thought about thoroughly cleaning up the castle and opening a cafe with Nephi. When Zagan was lost in thought, Nephi suddenly heard someone scream. The carriage they could use to leave for the city was stopped by a group of robbers. They took all the money from the coachman and the girl who was riding in the cart was dragged to her place. Nephi turned to the owner. Zagan said they looked like bandits. He noted that there were even magicians among them, and they were just a bunch of harmless bandits. And although an unenviable fate awaits the kidnapped, however, it was not worth getting into a fight. Suddenly he noticed how terrified Nephi was. He asked what it was. The girl only said that everything was fine, but there was still the same horror and fear in her eyes. Suddenly, he realized that Nephi could have been kidnapped in the same way. He looked up and told the girl to look carefully. He raised his hand, after which a huge force hit the place where he was pointing with his hand. Nephi was very surprised. Zagan said they were all just losers. Noticing the guy, the bandits were very scared, because he is a magician. They didn't understand why he needed it. Zagan thought that he would not say something cool and would just do his job. The bandits began to shout so that others would not run away, because the magician would not have time to cast a spell. One of the bandits rushed at the guy with an axe and said that they would smear him on the ground. Zagan managed to stop the axe blade with only one hand, which surprised the bandit. 
The man exclaimed that this could not be. Zagan grinned and asked what kind of fool would try to fight a magician with brute force. In the next instant, he gripped the bandit's axe with all his might, causing it to shatter into splinters. He pushed the man away slightly, after which the bandit flew to the side with all his strength while blood was flowing from his nose. He flew straight into another bandit. Zagan thought that in the face of fear, they were simply incapable of anything. He wanted to show Nephi that such people are not worth being afraid of. He turned to the girl and told her to stay behind him. The Nephi were shocked by what had happened. The bandits began to shout that their chief was pinned down. They panicked and asked their master for help. The next moment, a man in a black raincoat materialized out of thin air. He said it was an amazing sight to see a magician doing justice. Zagan realized that this was a mercenary magician. The wizard said that even this is included in his contract. He did not know who Zagan was, but he said that the guy would regret coming there. The next moment, an incredible magic circle flared up. The bandits began to scream, because the flames of magic had touched them too. Zagan only noted that the magician had increased the size of his sigil with the help of fire. He waved his hand and said he didn't think there was any point in waiting for the end. The magician exclaimed that Zagan was not bad, but he was still one step behind. He tried to do something, but nothing worked. He panicked and asked why nothing worked. Zagan confidently went forward and said that he had taken control of the sigil. He held up his finger and said it belonged to him now. The next moment, an explosion of incredible force thundered. Everyone watched in horror as Zagan left no trace of the mercenary. The guy asked the bandits why they were waiting. He told them to attack, because since they rob people, they should be ready for retribution. The bandits screamed in fear and fell to the floor, trembling with fear. Zagan turned around and saw Nephi staring at him. He panicked, thinking that he had made a mistake again. He cleared his throat and said that the bandits were harmless, like garbage, and if you beat them up a little, they were very cute. The girl asked if you could call them harmless after attacking civilians. Zagan was taken aback. The people who were nearby were in a small stupor for a short time, after which they all laughed out loud. They came up to the paddock and said it was great. They were surprised that there are also good magicians. The guy was in shock. The driver handed Zagan a bag of money and thanked the guy well, after which he asked if the magician would like to work as their guard for the rest of their journey. He said that, of course, he would pay the guy. Zagan was a little taken aback. He was genuinely surprised that even in this way he could earn money. He realized that, in other words, if he dealt with a couple of scoundrels, the money would flow like a river. Suddenly the guy realized something and stopped. It dawned on him that the main villains are usually magicians. He thought it was interesting enough. Before that, he had fought off bandits more than once, but this is the first time he is being thanked for it. At that time, people were hanging around Nephi. They asked if she was the guy's assistant, also saying that she was very beautiful and had a decent companion. The guy assumed that they weren't afraid of him just because Nephi was with him. They were sitting on the wagon together when Nephi suddenly turned to Zagan. The guy asked what happened. The girl looked into the cart and asked why he had saved these people. Zagan came to his senses and said that he had saved them by accident. In fact, he only wanted to show the girl that there was nothing to be afraid of, however, he was excited by the thought that this was their chance to get closer. He thought that in order to find the key to her heart, he needed to say something like he wanted to protect her, or he just couldn't leave people in trouble. He grinned, after which he said with a stern expression that he just wanted to point the trash to its true place. The girl silently looked at Zagan. The trip continued in awkward silence. Zagan stared blankly at the sky and couldn't understand why he kept talking such nonsense. Nephi just stared at Zagan in silence. The guys got to the city, where the driver smilingly told them that he would give them a ride again. The guys walked along the streets of the market together. Zagan thought that they needed to buy many other things besides groceries, but he did not know at all what a girl needed at all. The guys went to one of the shops, where Zagan said that Nephi could take whatever she needed. In response, the girl quietly said that she was quite satisfied with her rags. The guy was shocked by this answer. He silently thought that if a girl doesn't know what will happen to her tomorrow, then she won't have any desires either. He turned back and saw Nephi curtsy. He remembered that she had almost fallen yesterday. At that very moment, he decided what he would do next. When Zagan went into one of the boutiques, with a wry smile, a girl with wings on her back greeted him and asked what kind of clothes he was looking for. Zagan immediately realized that he was not welcome there. He quietly asked the girl to find something suitable for Nephi. The girl was surprised. The consultant happily approached Nephi and noted how beautiful the girl was. The next moment, she saw a large collar around the girl's neck. At that moment, she understood everything and took a deep breath. She took Nephi and told Zagan that he could count on Manuela, that was her name. She told Nephi that she would show her everything. 
At this time, the frightened girl was looking at the owner. Then Wayla quickly took everything off of Nephi. At that time, Zagan thought that everything had happened as he had feared. The caller attracted too much attention. He remembered the words of the presenter, who said that if he was removed, there was a possibility that Nephi would try to escape. He stopped abruptly. The very next moment Manuela came into the room and asked what Nephi Zagan would say about the outfit. The guy looked at the girl wearily when he saw a very revealing outfit in shock. Nephi was very embarrassed. Zagan exclaimed in shock, asking what it was. Manuela happily asked what the guy thought about it, after which she said it was the perfect combination. Zagan loudly asked why this was, and then asked if he hadn't asked for something appropriate. Manuela was surprised and said that she thought this was exactly what Zagan's tastes were. The guy wondered who she thought he was. Zagan looked at Nephi, and suddenly she was very confused. She blushed and asked him not to look at her. Zagan quickly told Manuela to pick up her usual casual clothes. The consultant said in frustration that such a model had been caught. Zagan exclaimed for her to quickly put away the thing in her hands. She was holding underwear. Manuela took Nephi away and started asking about different kinds of clothes, after which she laughingly said that it was just a joke. Zagan sighed heavily. After a while, Manuela brought out Nephi who was dressed in a maid's dress. She asked Zagan what he thought of this outfit. Both the dress and the apron are made of silk. The boots were enchanted so that fatigue would not be felt when walking. Zagan asked what Nephi thought. The girl said that any clothes would suit her. After this answer, the guy said that if she continued to talk like that, he would dress her in the previous outfit. Manuela's eyes lit up, but Nephi said she agreed to it. They thanked Manuela for the outfit. When suddenly, on leaving, she turned to Nephi and asked if the girl was happy to belong to the owner who valued her so highly. Hearing this, Nephi blushed a little and looked at Zagan, wondering if he appreciated her. She clutched her dress tightly. After that, Zagan called the girl and told her which store they needed to go to. She obediently followed him. There, the seller asked what Mr. Magician needed. Zagan said he wanted the employee to try to do something. He pointed to Nephi's collar and asked if the man knew how to take it off. The girl was amazed. Zagan said he couldn't get rid of the feeling that she was still Marcosa's property as long as she had the collar on. He said she didn't need it. The man agreed. Zagan walked away and began to reproach himself for treating Nephi like property again. The man asked the magician if this thing was enchanted. He said it didn't seem like they could help. He also added that he was embarrassed to say this in front of Nephi, but there might be traps in the collar. He said that if they tried to take him down using force, they could harm Nephi. Zagan noted that everything is exactly as he suspected, and this is too dangerous a way. Of course, he guessed about this, but the auction staff did not have a key. He handed a couple of coins to the seller and said it was a token of gratitude. The man refused and said that he had not even done anything like that, and would not have charged Zagan. He said that the guy had saved him once. He said it was almost a year ago. His wagon was attacked, but Zagan saved his daughter and himself. Then they fled in terror, but Zagan did not even try to catch up with them. He apologized to the guy. The guy assumed that they were attacked by the abomination that he was chasing around. He said that in this case he would take his money, but the man should not forget about that meeting, because he himself does not remember anything. The man said he would not forget her, and Zagan could come if he needed anything. The guys came out, and Zagan was completely perplexed. He didn't understand at all what was going on today. Everyone was so friendly that it terrified him. He wondered if it could be because he had taken Nephi with him. The man was sitting in the shop and did not know who would have thought that a person with such a repulsive aura could have such an expression on his face. The man smiled. The guys came to a cafe where there was a luxurious meal in front of them. Suddenly, Nephi hesitated and asked the guy if he really wanted to take off the collar. Zagan confirmed this. Nephi asked if he was afraid that she would run away from him if he took it off. The guy thought that, of course, it bothers him, because that's probably what will happen, because she doesn't need to be near him. But he thought that even if she ran away, he said he couldn't take it off right now, so she shouldn't get her hopes up. Zagan began to worry again, not understanding why he simply could not say that he wanted to take off the collar. Hearing this, Nephi smiled and said she understood. Zagan wondered if it could be that there is some kind of textbook that tells how to talk to girls. Suddenly he noticed that the girl was not eating. He asked what it was. Zagan assumed that she didn't know how to use a fork. The girl said that she knows how to use appliances, but this is the first time she has eaten like this. Zagan looked at her as realization dawned on him. He finally understood what attracted him so much to her. He used to be like that himself, helpless, homeless, in a world filled only with despair. He started eating and said that if she liked the food, then she should just eat, 
because she had nothing to be shy about there. She tried to answer, but he told her to eat. After that, he added that the food was better than the jerky they had eaten in the morning. The girl looked at the dish and then thanked her for the food. She tried to pick up a tomato with a fork, but she couldn't. Zagan stared at her in silence, which made her blush with shame. Suddenly she saw a spoon on the table. He immediately took it and put the tomato in his mouth. She rolled it in her mouth while Zagan just silently waited for her to start chewing. The next moment, she saw through it and was surprised. She chewed it and swallowed it. Zagan asked how her food was. The girl said admiringly that she thought it was very tasty. Zagan smiled. She said she thought it would be sweeter, but it turned out to be juicy and tender. Zagan thought that these little tomatoes really looked like candy. He tried to pick up a tomato with a fork, but he also failed. He was silent while Nephi also looked at him. He sighed, then tried again and again, but it never worked out. There was an awkward silence. Nephi lifted a tomato onto a spoon and handed it to the guy. Seeing this, Zagan was amazed that she wanted to feed him. He also noticed that she was touching her lips with this spoon. He wondered if this was normal. He quickly stretched out his head and ate a tomato with a spoon, after which he said that it was very tasty. They both blushed deeply. Nephi noticed that the master never ordered her to do anything. The same red guy agreed with this. Suddenly, the girl said that she wanted to be useful to Zagan, after which she asked if he would allow it. The guy looked at her in surprise. He agreed and said that it was in case she wanted it. Nephi thanked him and said she would try her best. When Zagan was able to take the tomato with a fork, he handed it to the girl. Nephi was surprised. He asked if she didn't like them. He told her to take it. Nephi blushed, then ate a tomato. He asked her how she was. The girl said it was very tasty. Suddenly, they heard people in the cafe laughing at them. Immediately after that, they left there. They rediscovered this relationship. The master and the maid. For a while, their lives went on quietly. At this time, in the huge building, the night girl was sighing. A priest came into the room and asked if something was bothering her. The girl immediately stood in front of him and greeted him. He said that there was no need for formality and noted that she was one of those heroes who defeated the apostates who were engaged in kidnappings. She said that four holy knights had also died because of her and that the man had sent them under her command. She said she wasn't worthy of it. The man said that she took revenge and was able to return, so she should be proud of it. She thanked him but thought it was a lie. They really found the culprits, and they turned out to be a magician and that they wanted to sacrifice the girl. But on the way back, their colleague attacked them. It was one of the magicians. He tore off and used their comrade's skin. She was on the verge of the same terrible fate. But the magician was not struck down by her, but by another magician named Zagan. His eyes exuded malice, and he killed his attacker without regret, and yet there was a kind of loneliness in him. The priest said that this is not the end. They examined the magician's shelter and found out that the organizer was still at large. The girl asked who it was. The man said it was Zagan, and he was the one behind the string of kidnappings. The girl exclaimed that it must be a mistake. The man said that it was very unlikely that he had nothing to do with it. Besides, magicians are evil. Even if he is not involved, they still have to punish evil. The girl turned to the eminence and asked him to entrust it to her. The man said that she had a great attitude, and this would be her assignment. She was the Virgin of the Holy Sword, the Captain of the Holy Knights, Castel Lilquist. The boy was caught by the head in a strong grip and lifted up. The magician laughed loudly, bringing his hand with the seal to the boy's face. The poor child screamed loudly. The next moment, the magician's hand was covered in the boy's blood. Zagan opened his eyes. Nephi asked if he was awake. The girl was standing in front of him. She said he was ready tomorrow and asked if he wanted to eat. Zagan asked in surprise if she had cooked breakfast. The girl confirmed it. The guy asked if she was really waiting for him to wake up. Nephi said she also admired his face. Zagan blushed. Suddenly he realized something and then hesitated. He quietly wished her a good morning. The girl also wished him that. Together they went into another room. The guy noted that he was finally able to say hello to her properly. They went into the kitchen, where everything shone with cleanliness. Zagan said in amazement that earlier the room looked like a cemetery. He noticed food on the edge of the table. He was surprised and asked if they had bought bread yesterday. The girl said she baked it herself. Zagan was even more startled. The girl asked if it was really that strange. Zagan said he didn't even know, because he had never met people who could cook well, especially something appetizing. Nephi's ears began to move and she asked if it was true. Zagan was surprised and wondered if this could mean that she was happy. He asked if she had eaten. She said she hadn't eaten, and Zagan suggested we eat together. The girl said that she cooked only for him. Zagan asked if she was hungry. She said she forgot to cook her portion. The guy said that they would share a portion for two and invited her to sit down. 
she said that she had prepared a place only for him. Zagan thought about it, then told her to sit on his lap. There was a silence in the room, after which they both blushed. Nephi said she couldn't show such disrespect. Zagan, with a stern face, told her not to worry and just sit down. He began to reproach himself for his stupidity. The girl blushed and said that if it was the master's will, then she would do it. She sat on his lap. Zagan blushed, because it really happened. He handed her the food and told her to eat, but Nephi said it was too embarrassing. The guy looked at her drooping ears and said he guessed. She said he was too cruel. He told her to cook for herself next time. The girl agreed. He said he didn't mind repeating it, but she said she'd rather cook more. Suddenly, Nephi handed him a spoon. She asked him to let her help. The guy was shocked, because she decided to pay back. He would like her to do this all the time, but she is too ashamed. The guy said he was warm, but he came to his senses and said it was because of the soup. Nephi blushed and agreed. After a while, Zagan was engaged, and she was cleaning up. Nephi asked what kind of research he was doing. The guy asked what it could be, if not magic. Nephi said it looked like her, but she didn't know what the circles and signs were. The guy asked if elves really had other magic. The girl said she didn't know, because she couldn't do magic. The guy was surprised, because her mana reserve should be much higher than human ones. He pointed to one of the symbols and said that they were concepts endowed with power. They say these are old writings that seal the contract between the devil and God. He didn't know if it was true. Such symbols are the base, the blueprint of magic, and the magic circle consists of them. A Zagan circle can generate lightning if enough mana is poured into it. Suddenly, a small crackling sound appeared from the circle. Nephi wondered if it was lightning. Zagan said that the magic of such a circle melts instantly. Therefore, it is necessary to frame it with additional symbols that will give her strength and prolong her time. After that, he created a strong lightning bolt. He said that anyone can use the circle if they pour mana. Therefore, precautions should be taken to ensure that it is not intercepted. Otherwise, it can be easily used against him. A certified magic circle is called a sigil, and the frame is called a chain. He asked her what she didn't understand. She said that the guy added a chain from the outside, and then asked if it was possible to add it to the inner circle. He said that she was thinking correctly. This can be done in theory, but not in practice. Her suggestion is to add a new circle to an existing sigil. This disrupts the circulation of mana inside, and the magic will either fail or be unpredictable. But magic is a controlled flow of mana, so this is possible in theory. She asked if it would be possible to take control of the spell in action. He confirmed this and said that if a magician is capable of this, then he will become invulnerable to magic. Any magic will only be a source of power. Such a magician will be the strongest. He said that theory remains theory, and if it were possible, it would be less hassle. Also, no one took up the study of this issue normally. Magicians are only interested in the limits of magic and resurrection. They are not belligerent like knights and mercenaries. Discussing guys is exactly how to fight, and can only be used to take away the labors of other magicians. However, there are still fools doing this. Nephi said she understood the principles, but doesn't that mean that anyone can do magic if they understand the process of creating a sigil? It was true. For a magician, gaining knowledge is equivalent to increasing his strength. Therefore, they defend their research in different ways. He told Nephi to be careful and not to touch anything. He added that he was joking, because he had already made sure that the traps did not react to her. Nephi said he was stupid. He asked why she was happy. Nephi asked how he understood. He thought her ears were showing everything. The girl said it was the first time she had talked to him for so long. Zagan thought that was the case, and he always answered her in monosyllables. He said magic was the only thing he had, and he was happy to talk about it. The girl asked why he wanted to become stronger and what he was trying so hard to achieve. Zagan wondered what he wanted. Nephi apologized for the tactless question. Zagan said that everything was fine, and he never thought about it. If you need to give a reason, then he wanted to survive. She was surprised. Zagan said that when he was little, he had nothing, and he stole to live. But one day he was caught by a magician. Children are also used in sacrifices, and that magician tried to kill him, but Zagan fought back. Then he realized that he needed strength to live. That's why he wants to become stronger. His goal was immortality and eternal youth. Nephi said she couldn't have been that strong. Zagan wanted to offer her something about magic, when suddenly he felt something. There were people on the threshold of the castle. He said they had guests and he would meet them, and she should cook dinner. He told her to cook for two, because they wouldn't stay long. The knights were shocked that the main culprit was there. They were walking in circles. Castle said it was a magical barrier. She told them to move away. She cut through the barrier with her sword. Zagan stood in front of them. 
He wondered if they didn't teach how to behave at a party in church. She said she thought it was him. Zagan did not recognize the girl. Nephi noticed that all the seasonings were in mold, and they needed to take more. According to legend, twelve holy swords defeated the demon king, the strongest heart of the church and a symbol of its power. It is said that these precious swords themselves choose the owner, and one of them chose a 13-year-old girl who became the only female captain in the ranks of the holy knights. Zagan thought that they had already met. He realized that she was the one who was almost killed near his house. If he had known that she was a holy knight, he would not have let her go. Castle turned to him. Zagan said he was busy, and then attacked them. They said that magicians are really cowards if they attack without warning. They told Castle they would deal with him. Zagan suggested that they take their things and leave. They tried to attack him, but he easily broke through the shield and defeated the knight. He flew back. Zagan told them to leave if they didn't want the girl to carry three bodies on her. Another knight charged. Castle wanted to stop him, but he didn't want to. Zagan also easily broke his sword. He hit him and put him in the ground. He asked if the man understood that if he applied more strength, the knight's head would burst. You will never forget that sound. Zagan said he remembers it well. Castle was preparing to attack. He told her not to try, because the knight's head would break before it moved. The girl left her sword. She asked why he was acting like he was laughing at them. Castle asked if he liked to humiliate the defeated. He asked if she knew how best to use fear. People are afraid of the unknown, and if he kills them all, it will only be a figure for the authorities. To instill fear in them, they need to go back and tell about it. She asked if that was the reason he wasn't killing them. She said it was a lie. She said he was protecting himself, and the church would do as he said. But his reasons are different. He thought that if Nephi saw the corpses, he would be scared. The girl realized that she was right. She charged. The guy realized that everything was bad, because she realized that he was not going to kill them. Castell introduced herself and said that by order of the eminence, he would fall into her hands. She charged. He thought that her blows were strong, even though the dedicated armor increases her strength. But she is only a weak girl. She didn't understand why he was dodging, or if it was because she was an unworthy opponent. He said he didn't like hitting women. However, he just couldn't hit a girl the same age as Nephi. She asked why a man like him would get his hands dirty with magic. He asked if it was terrible. She said that magic is evil, and they use it to suppress people. The guy asked why the power of the priests was needed. He asked if they were using it to kill weak magicians. She tried to attack him, but he stood on her sword. He did not try to justify himself, but many would not have survived without magic. He asked if she was trying to get rid of such people, then could she call herself a righteous man of justice. The girl drooped. He didn't want to see her like this because it's harder to attack. She said that was why she couldn't lose. She attacked him, but he grabbed her sword. He asked if she wanted to face off, which she agreed to. Suddenly she spun the sword and threw Zagan aside. He noticed that she still had something left. Magic was slower to heal him. This was the effect of the holy sword. She attacked him again. He had no choice but to kill her. She asked if he could pretend that she had killed him. The guy was shocked. She said the church wouldn't stop until he died. If they lose, they will send a stronger knight. He needed to pretend that she killed him and get off the path of a magician and live like an ordinary person. This was not what he expected to hear from the knight. She said that he had not killed her subordinates, and despite his words, there was condescension in his eyes. She said she hadn't forgotten that he had saved her. That was all she could do to help. He thought that this choice was not easy for her. If the holy knight protects the magician, he will be branded a traitor. A terrible fate awaits him. She's not stupid enough not to understand that. But Zagan couldn't do it. All those associated with the magician are branded, and death awaits them. If he escapes, they'll get Nephi. He didn't know what to do. Suddenly Nephi ran out. He shouted at her to stay away. One of the wounded knights tried to kill the girl and pointed a weapon at her. Zagan quickly moved and got hit instead of her. Nephi was scared. He said it was all right. He was about to kill the knight when he suddenly felt strong waves. Sprouts began to rise from the ground. The embittered Nephi said that they dared to harm the owner. Zagan didn't understand what was going on. The sprouts grew and grabbed the knights, squeezing and killing them. The guy caught Nephi and told her to stop. The girl froze. Castle was shocked. Zagan wondered if this was Nephi's power. She was working on his hand in the house. The holy knights retreated. Castle was apologizing, because they shouldn't have interfered with outsiders. He was surprised that she apologized in such a situation. Zagan said he didn't think Nephi could use magic. The girl said it wasn't magic. The guy asked what it was. To her silence, he said it didn't matter, because he didn't care what kind of power she had. 
Noticing the drooping girl, he thought it sounded like he didn't care. He said she was Nephi, and always would be, no matter how powerful she was. He was glad he could say that. The girl thanked him. He asked if she was scared. She was surprised that he had asked her about it. She asked if she was scaring him. The guy didn't understand how she could scare him. He said that he had never met a similar force before, and he was curious. She was amazed that this was all. She hesitated and said that this power was called witchcraft. He was surprised that it existed. Unlike magic, based on logic and clear principles, witchcraft is embodied from the desires of the sorcerer. Almost limitless power, a miracle beyond comprehension. Zagan asked if all elves could use it. It wasn't like that. Nephi could because she was a cursed child. No one should have that kind of power, and she shouldn't have been born. Therefore, when people attacked them, she was ordered to defend the village. They said she owed them for letting her live. When she heard that, something clicked in her head, and she didn't resist, and people caught her. Residents fled in panic. Most had been killed, and she had heard that elves could be useful even when dead. Looking at what was happening, she thought they deserved it. She asked if it was terrible. She had heard them curse her before she died, but she was glad. It was their turn to suffer. Then she realized what she had done. She stood and watched them die with a cold-blooded smile. She apologized to Zagan and asked if she disgusted him. He didn't understand why she should be disgusted with him. She tried to answer something, but Zagan said that in her place he would have killed the residents along with the attackers. He said she didn't understand something. She thought witchcraft was bad, but power itself is neither good nor bad. The labels are put up by the people themselves. She said what she did was unforgivable. He asked who wouldn't forgive her. Nephi wanted to talk about the villagers, but Zagan said they were dead and she should forget about them because they no longer have the strength to complain. If she is strong, then she should live and use the force. Otherwise, she will insult the memory of those who died because they were weak. She asked if she could have that kind of power. He asked if it was bad to have this power and if it was evil to want to become stronger. The girl hesitated. He smiled and said that he was also called evil in the flesh. Nephi was genuinely shocked. Zagan said that he once saved a young girl from bandits. He told her that it was natural for the weak to die, and if she didn't want that, then she needed to become stronger. She only asked if the weak didn't deserve the right to live. She asked if he liked showing off his strength that much. At that moment, he regretted saving her. Pity and kindness are poisons that corrupt people, and the girl was already under his influence. She was weak and the strong will definitely take advantage of weakness. But he didn't want to become like her, so he became stronger. It is a mistake to hope that in the hour of need they will come to his aid. If a child, abandoned even by his parents, hopes for others, then he has learned nothing. That's why he wanted it badly. In the end, he realized that he could not trust anyone. And although the feeling of loneliness tormented him, he did not attach any importance to it. He knew that he could only believe in his own strength, and that was enough to survive. And even though he said it, he was confused when Nephi became sad. Someday this contradiction will finish him off, and yet, even if he has to sacrifice his old life for it, he will not leave it. He told her not to make that face, because he needed her. Nephi asked if she could stay with him. The guy agreed and said that she cooks delicious, and he can no longer imagine his life without her. Nephi burst into tears, and Zagan hugged her. She cried for a long time until she calmed down. Later, she said that the fact that he saw her like this was terribly embarrassing. He said it wasn't a bad thing, because it was the first time she had talked to him for so long. She scolded him. She asked if his arm hurt. The guy said he wasn't there anymore. She took off the bandage, and there was no trace of wounds on her arm. The guy asked if she had done it. He thought that the healing magic was not working because of the sword, and it happened when he touched it. He thanked the girl. He noticed her gaze and asked what it was. Nephi said it was the first time he had told her that. He was surprised that he had never thanked her and apologized. She said it was all right because she was his. At night, he was sitting in an empty hall when Nephi came up to him. He asked what happened. The girl shyly asked if she could sleep with him. Upon hearing this, Zagan blushed deeply. He blushed, thinking that he was a guy, not a girl. He turned to Nephi and asked if she understood what she was talking about. He wondered if she had decided to give herself to him. The girl said she understood, because there was only one bed in the castle. The guy was surprised. Nephi said that the master always sleeps on his throne, and it seemed to her that it was more convenient to sleep lying down. She said that if he didn't mind, they could sleep together. Zagan was surprised. He realized that the girl was not offering herself, but really just sleeping together. He thought she was all innocence. He thanked her for her concern. But this place is the foundation of his barrier, and he needs to be there in case something happens. The girl said she thought so. She sat down and invited him to lie on her lap. He was even more startled. 
he thought that he couldn't refuse such an offer. If I asked him how he was, Zagan replied that it was pretty good. It tickled him, but it felt good, even though he had nowhere to look. He asked why she had suggested it so suddenly. The girl said that the owner allowed her to stay with him even after learning about her strength, and she wanted to express her gratitude. Zagan said she was already doing a lot for him, and they didn't need formalities. Nephi agreed. Suddenly he touched her face and asked if she wanted him to teach her magic. The girl was surprised. Zagan said that, judging by what happened today, she has no control over her abilities. He didn't know if training would help bring the force under control, but at least she would be able to protect herself. She asked if she could really do it. He confirmed it and said that she would become a magician even better than him. She asked if she could be useful to him. Zagan said she was already helping. Nephi asked if she could protect him. He asked if she hadn't protected him from the holy knights today. The girl said she was willing to learn magic for him. Zagan wanted her to do it for herself, but he didn't mind. From that day on, she became his student. She agreed and turned to him about the fact that yesterday he said that he did not understand those who were weak, and that he was able to do everything himself. Zagan said he said that. She noted that he said it with ease, after which she assumed that it was very difficult for him. Zagan was taken aback. He asked her what made her decide. She didn't know the answer, but he looked very sad at the time. She hugged him and said that he was not evil, and he rarely said anything, but she would never forget about his kindness. The guy was shocked. He heard her, and then closed his eyes. He thought it wasn't all that bad. After a while, Barbaros came to the castle. Zagan was calmly drinking tea. Alarmed, Barbaros said he had heard that his friend had been attacked by holy knights. He asked if it was true. Zagan said he didn't know they would be so weak. Barbaros said that according to rumors, there was even the owner of the holy sword. Zagan said that someone seemed to be. Barbaros asked if Zagan was saying that even the virgin of the holy sword was not his equal. The guy said that she was quite strong, and she was able to crush the castle barrier. Tea was placed in front of Barbaros and he was told to add sugar and milk if desired. He was about to thank the servant, but was shocked to see Nephi. He poured the tea. Zagan caught the drink with magic. Barbaros asked if this was the elf. Zagan confirmed this. Barbaros was surprised that Zagan had not sacrificed her yet, and in exchange for her life she became his maid. Zagan told Barbaros not to compare him to himself, because Nephi is his student. Barbaros was even more shocked. Zagan said that there is magic that he cannot handle alone, and he is sure that Nephi will be useful to him. The girl thanked him for these words. Barbaros took the tea and noticed that when paired with an elf, Zagan can use almost any magic. He didn't think it could be used like that. Zagan thought that their speeches were similar, but he did not like the mention of Nephi as an instrument. Barbaros asked if this meant that the elf had helped him defeat the holy knights. Zagan said it was due to the power of Nephi. Barbaros asked if this meant that the situation in the courtyard was her doing. He asked if Zagan had really decided to become a demon lord. The guy wondered if, if he became a demon lord, the magicians would leave Nephi alone. He didn't need the throne, but if he could get it, then he wasn't sure. He asked if there was a reason for him not to do it. He told Nephi that the tea tasted good. Barbaros sternly asked if his friend had any special feelings for Nephi. Zagan asked if it was strange to patronize his student. That word helped him out. Barbaros laughed and said that even in Zagan there is still something human. Zagan barked at his friend. Barbaros got up and went to the exit. Zagan asked why he came at all. Nephi asked if they were friends. Zagan exclaimed that she shouldn't joke like that, because if you don't choose your friends carefully, they only bring trouble. It seemed to the girl that the owner was having fun. Zagan was surprised. He thought it was absurd, and Nephi misunderstood everything. The guy said it was time to restore the barrier and start teaching Nephi. The girl obediently followed him. For the next few days, they worked hard and studied magic. Zagan taught Nephi the basics of magic. She had reached a level where she could have used magic if she hadn't been wearing that collar. As for witchcraft, she still hadn't managed to master it. And so, in the blink of an eye, half a month has passed since Zagan bought Nephi. While cleaning the mansion, the girl suddenly heard a bolt of lightning. She looked outside and saw Zagan standing in a field while a huge black bird hovered right above him. The guy said suspiciously that it was very unexpected. By this time, the frightened Nephi had already gone out into the courtyard. The bird handed the guy a small envelope. Nephi asked what it was. Zagan said it was an invitation from the Twelve Lords. Cyanide, a thriving and bustling city riddled with a network of canals that are used to transport goods. Right under this city lies the abandoned castle of the demon Lord Marcosis. And in this very place, the remaining Twelve Lords gathered, as well as Zagan. The guy didn't understand what they wanted from him. One of the lords noted that this is Zagan. The guy felt a chill on his back. 
the man said that he had heard that Zagan was young, but the guy was almost a child. They were curious, because Zagan could become the youngest among them. Zagan felt like a frog being stared at by a snake. It felt like he had already been eaten. The guy realized what the pinnacle of the magical society is, the demon lords. He grinned at me. The guy asked if they had called him just to observe. He said that if he satisfied their curiosity, then he would probably go back to his business. The lords laughed at the harsh words of a guy in such a place. It was audacious. One of them said that, in that case, they would also speak directly. He exclaimed to Zagan that they had called him to join them. They offered him to become the 13th demon lord. Zagan was shocked. The Lord summoned magic of incredible power and told Zagan to see the seal of the Lord, which Marcosis possessed. He told Zagan to inherit it, and then he would receive the status of a demon lord. Zagan stared at the unusual seal in amazement. He thought that there was a monstrous concentration of mana in it, and he was surprised that they were offering it to him. He thought that the demon lord it's just a title, but that kind of power comes from everyone in the meeting. Suddenly, he realized that a simple magician did not have the slightest chance in front of lords with such power. Suddenly one of them, still smiling, asked if something was wrong, and Zagan wanted to refuse. The guy smiled and said that he was just flattered, because there are many magicians much stronger than him. He didn't understand why he was the one. Vladika said that this was an obvious question. He stated that Zagan's strength was indeed small, and yet no magician could defeat him. Zagan chuckled to himself. Vladika stated that Andras the troublemaker was the first person the guy killed. He was far from weak, but Zagan was able to defeat him. He was also able to take over Andras' legacy. An eight-year-old child managed to kill a magician, and even one with a title. They said that the guy managed to learn the spell after seeing it only once. Moreover, after seeing it only once, he was able to understand the essence and structure of magic. This was the source of Zagan's power. The guy realized that they already knew about his little secret. The master said that this was truly amazing magic, and at the same time it was terrible and disgusting. Whatever Zagan wants will be his, and no one will stop it. Anyone the guy wants to kill will die, and no one can resist it. If Zagan tries to get someone else's power, the magicians will have to give it to him without a trace. They said it was truly the power of a tyrant, a power befitting the title of Demon Lord. Zagan became stern. They said that one day he would become the most powerful magician in history. And therefore, even though he is weak now, he will still take a chance and give him the title of Lord. Everything was for the development of his potential and for the sake of the future of magic. Zagan turned away and said that if these words were true, then he did not understand what prevented him from taking their power right now. Suddenly, a strong pressure rose in the room. The lords confirmed this, but said that they were warning the guy, because it was possible that he would lose more than he would receive from them. Zagan turned pale, and the image of Nephi appeared before his eyes. They said that the revenge of the lords is not a threat of reprisal. They'll take everything, his possessions, his loved ones, even his name. They will destroy his very existence. That's what was waiting for Zagan. It was something he should be willing to go against. Peace and tranquility will become only dreams, and an abyss beyond the possibilities of magic will open above him. That's the world he's about to enter. Zagan turned even paler. He thought it was too late. When he became a magician, or even earlier, when he had to become a magician, because there was no other choice. Even then, he had lost hope of a peaceful life. For a magician, there are only two ways, to reach the top, or rot on the way to it. And he had been walking along it for a long time. He reintroduced Nephi. He didn't know if he could pull her into this world with him. Vladika said that they were waiting for an answer from the guy. Zagan said there was something else he needed, and his answer depended on whether he got it. Vladika agreed and said that Zagan was free to do whatever he wanted with him. The guy held out his hand and said that in that case he would accept their offer and he would become a demon lord. Suddenly, concentrated energy reached out to him. The lord said that they should welcome their new colleague, the magician Zagan. They will give him a title, and from now on he will have a new title. At that time, Nephi was cleaning the castle when she suddenly heard someone come back. She immediately came out and greeted the owner joyfully, saying that she had cooked lamb chowder today. Suddenly, the girl began to worry. She saw that Zagan was too serious. The tense girl asked him if something was wrong. Zagan thought that from the very beginning his fate was sealed. But Nephi became only a random ray of light that looked into this world. With a heavy voice, Zagan said that he had become the Lord of Demons. Nephi looked at him in disbelief. Zagan raised his hand and showed the mark. He said that he had become the ruler of all magicians, the one the others are following. He has climbed to the top of magic. Nephi was delighted and congratulated the guy on this. Zagan also said that he inherited the title of Lord, and with it he received the entire legacy of Marcosis. Suddenly he picked up a small key. 
he quickly brought it to Nephi's neck and turned it around. In the blink of an eye, the magic circle on Nephi's collar cracked, and Zagan said he was removing these shackles from her. Nephi looked at her neck in amazement, where there was nothing now. She looked at Zagan and tried to formulate her question. Suddenly Zagan said that the Lord no longer needed her help, and from now on she was free. After these words, he said goodbye to her. Nephi turned pale from shock. Nephi sat on one of the steps outside and stared into the void. Suddenly she looked up and tried to figure out what she was doing in this place. There were ruined buildings around her. She remembered that she had been cooking dinner recently. She was making lamb stew, which her master liked so much. She got up and thought she had to get back as soon as possible. Suddenly she heard a sound. She turned around and saw her collar on the ground. Nephi turned pale. At that very moment, she remembered what had happened earlier. She picked up the collar and said that the owner had thrown it away. She remembered how he had told her that she needed to live for him. All those moments when he took care of her. When he gave her a room and asked if she was okay. There were words in her head that he needed her. Nephi lowered her head and thought that even now she couldn't cry. Even though Zagan said he would be by her side, he left her. She sat down again and drooped. Suddenly someone came up to her and asked if she was okay. It was Castle. Suddenly, the girl realized that it was Nephi who was with Sagan then. Nephi looked up and realized that the Holy Knight was standing right in front of her. She got up and staggered a little towards Castle. She smiled coldly and asked if Castle had come to kill her. Castle was confused. Nephi started walking towards her. She asked the Holy Knight to behead her or kill her in any other way. Castle started screaming that Nephi had misunderstood everything and she didn't want to kill anyone. Nephi came even closer and asked if the Holy Knights were hunting magicians. She said she was a student of a magician. Castle panicked and screamed from the pressure of the elf. Suddenly, passers-by began to notice what was happening. They recognized the elf as baby Nephi. They thought she was being accosted by a Holy Knight. They said it was probably because she was serving a magician. Nephi asked what was wrong. She asked if it wasn't a knight's duty to execute anyone connected with magic. Castle screamed at Nephi to stop talking like she was a murderer. Nephi asked if that was true. Castle exclaimed that it was a lie. Suddenly Manuela jumped up in front of the Holy Knight and ordered her to stop. Nephi was surprised. Manuela asked what Castle was doing. She didn't understand since when Holy Knights were allowed to harass little girls. She asked if Castle had no conscience at all. The girl began to say that this was not the case and tried to justify herself, but passers-by also joined in. They shouted that it was not because Nephi often buys from them, but because she is a kind-hearted girl. They said that Nephi's face even turned pale, and all because of this villainous. Nephi stared at it in silence, not knowing what to say. Castle also couldn't say anything. The crowd shouted at her to leave. She was told that she was a monster and not to come back. On her knees, Castle was trying to say something to the angry crowd. Suddenly Nephi intervened and said that the knight had done nothing to her. The crowd froze. They asked why Nephi was so pale. Castle, who was sitting on the floor, could not stand it and began to shake. She burst into loud tears and recalled that she had already said that she just thought that Nephi needed help, and she wanted to help her. Manuela felt awkward while Castle was sobbing non-stop. After a while, they stopped at a tavern, where Castle apologized for such unsightly behavior. There was silence. Manuela asked if she really hadn't done anything to Nephi. Castle asked how many times she could repeat it. The girl asked if Castle had done something earlier. The girl said she was doing her duty. Manuela stated that Castle was hiding behind debt to hurt people. Castle started crying again. Nephi said that everything was fine, because everything was fine. Manuela asked if it was true. Nephi said that the owner had been harmed by another person, and he had already learned his lesson. Castle remembered that the man now had a fear of trees. Manuela asked what Castle was doing then, and if she was carrying things. Nephi said she was carrying the others as they retreated. Castle screamed that this was not true, because she was the virgin of the Holy Sword, one of the twelve commanders of the Holy Knights. She didn't understand how anyone could describe her like that. Nephi asked if she had lied about something. Castle hesitated. Nephi was surprised that she was so timid, because she seemed very brave during the task. Soup was placed in front of Nephi. The girl said she couldn't accept it and she didn't have any money. Manuela said she was treating the girl. She also added that Castle pays for herself. Nephi tasted the soup and thought it was so similar to what she cooked for the master. It was a lamb stew. Suddenly, Nephi began to cry. The girls looked at her in surprise and started asking if she was okay. Castle didn't understand if she had done something wrong, but Nephi wondered why the owner had done it. She started crying a lot. Manuela hugged Nephi. She said that Nephi could cry into her sister's vest as much as she wanted. 
She also hugged Castel. After a while, Nefe told about what had happened. The girls asked if he had escorted her out after that and hadn't even explained anything. Castel said she thought he was a decent man, but he was just using her. Nefe said that the master is not like that. Castel said she didn't need to be angry. Nefe said she wasn't mad. The emotionless face scared Castel. Manuela asked if it was possible that he had changed in some way. She asked if Nefi had noticed anything before he sent her away. Suddenly, she remembered his words and asked who the demon lord was. Manuela asked if that was what the best magicians were called. This city used to be under the control of Vladica Marcosis, order reigned under him. But after his death terrible things happened one after another. Castel asked if Manuela was talking about kidnapping girls. The girl confirmed this and said that he seemed to have already been caught by the ministers of the church. Castel fell silent. Nephi said that the townspeople don't treat the church very well. Manuela stated that this is because they demand huge sums for any help. All this time, she was looking at Castel. Nephi said that Castel was not conducting these gatherings, and she did not think it was worth blaming the girl. Castel said that Nephi is very kind and she understands why he wanted her around. She said that the church calls the lords the embodiment of evil and says that they must destroy them, even at the cost of their lives. But for every twelve wielders of holy swords, there are thirteen lords. Even if each of them takes one with them, they will still survive. And if a new demon lord appears, then the church will make every effort to kill him before he accumulates enough strength. In addition to this, other magicians also want this title. Nephi thought it might end in bloodshed. She suggested that this might be the reason. Castle said she wanted to ask Nephi for something. She asked if Nephi had seen other magicians accompany Zagan, or that he kidnapped people and performed sacrifices. Nephi said there was no such thing. Although the owner does not show it, he is very worried about the weak. Even when he recaptured the wagon from the bandits, he said that he did it only because he couldn't stand them. But most likely he said it to calm Nephi down. Castle said she was right. As Nephi says, when they fought, he didn't fight at full strength because she is a woman. She was ashamed to admit it. Manuela laughed and asked if Virgo had fallen in love. Castle blushed and asked what kind of nonsense it was, because that wasn't what she was leading up to. She said that the first time they met, he looked like a man who needed help. Nephi was surprised. Castle said that even if he does not admit it himself and tries to hide his feelings, he is looking for reciprocity and warmth. She couldn't describe it, but Nephi understood. It was when he was talking about the past. Nephi noticed that she wasn't the only one who understood his feelings. She was jealous, but she was glad. The master was indeed the way she knew him. He wouldn't kick her out because she's useless. She said she wanted to go back to him. Manuela panicked. Nephi said that the master is strong and won't lose, but that doesn't mean that he can't be hurt. You can't leave anyone alone with you for long. She wanted to be his support and support. Castle said she would help in any way she could. Nephi asked if she wanted to fight him. Castle said that this was not the case, and some magician was committing crimes under the name of Zagan. She couldn't help directly, but she could get rid of the stains on her reputation. They asked if knights were enemies of magicians. Castle confirmed this and said that he had already saved her twice, but she had not paid him. Manuela said that since they had come to their senses, they would finish. She told the waitress that Castle would pay for everything. The girl screamed that she even did, but she did not order it. Manuela said she was joking. Nephi asked why Manuela was so kind to her. The girl asked if they were not friends. Nephi was surprised. She said that no one had ever called her that before. Manuela hugged her and told her that she would be her first friend and let everything be fine with them. Nephi agreed. Castle raised her hand and asked if she could consider her a friend too. Manuela asked if a knight could be friends with a magician. The girl was afraid to say something again. Manuela hugged them with her wings and asked if she could make fun of her like that if they weren't friends. Castle asked if this was part of the friendship. Suddenly, someone called the knight. They saw Castle and didn't understand what was going on. Nephi recognized the people who had harmed the master, and Castle thought that things would get more complicated. Manuela asked if they had injured Zagan, after which she said that she did not like the church. They did not understand why Manuela was so hostile to the church. At the same time Castle said that she did not plan to do anything wrong. Suddenly, dark energy enveloped them. Someone said that friendship is wonderful. An unknown person grabbed Nephi and Castle. The knight pushed Manuela away. The unknown person said that one had left, but everything was fine. He said his name was Zagan, and if they wanted to free them, he was waiting for them in his castle. Nephi was shocked. In the pitch darkness, the hero was all alone. The young man with a sad expression noticed that being all alone, it became very quiet around. The hero silently stared at the night sky. One of the Azure Sky Knights he had defeated groaned. 
One of the three defeated warriors lying on the magic circle expressed his displeasure at their defeat. Another warrior expressed surprise at how easily the young man defeated the three knights of the azure sky. The hero silently turned towards the slain enemies. The young man looked haughtily at the exhausted enemies and said that they themselves suddenly attacked him, and then fell into a trap. He did not even have to do anything. The young man remembered that Nephi had set all these traps. Remembering this fragment, the young man thought about it. The hero clenched his fist fiercely. He reminded himself that he had met Nephi only half a month ago. When this fuss had subsided, no one would think that they were somehow connected. He remembered that the people of Kyanid were kind to Nephi. There, away from the magicians and the church, she will be able to live in peace. He had a picture in his head of the townspeople of Kyanid cheering and caring for Nephi. The young man turned around and set off. Behind him, one of the knights was lying on the ground, who clearly wanted to do something. The warrior grabbed the hero by the leg and frantically asked him to stop. The hero looked at the defeated warrior. The knight of the azure sky said that they did not care what happened to them and asked the young man to spare Madame Chastel. Tears appeared in the knight's eyes. He added that his mistress was so sure that he was not behind the kidnappings that, trying to find the culprit, she contradicted the cardinal himself. He tearfully asked to let her go. The young man looked at the knight in disbelief and clarified the name of Chastel. He asked the knight in disbelief what he was talking about. Suddenly, a shout was heard addressing the young man. A winged woman fell from the sky and landed on the back of the knight's head. Her appearance slightly surprised the young man. The knight was clearly unhappy that the woman had painfully landed on his head. The warrior angrily asked the woman what she was doing, addressing her as a feathered one. The woman furiously reminded the knights that the young man was not an intruder. The skirmish of this couple annoyed the hero. He noticed to himself how annoying they were. He began to cast some kind of spell and thought about how to expel them. The woman abruptly turned towards the hero and asked him for help. The young man looked at the girl with wings with a biased mood. The woman told the young man that Nephi and Shastel had been kidnapped. Her words surprised the magician greatly. She also added that she tried to hide their acquaintance and suggested that it was already too late. The woman grabbed the hero by the cloak and once again asked him to save the girls. The young man looked confused. The hero fell into despair. He knew he couldn't just turn a blind eye to it, but if that happened, the church wouldn't leave her alone. The hero realized that he could not just rush to save her. He needed to figure out how to do it unnoticeably. The woman aggressively asked the hero why he was so slow. Her words stunned the young man. The winged maiden declared that Nephi was going to return to him. Her words surprised the magician greatly. The woman screamed that Nephi wanted to be with the young man, to be his support. She added that no matter how many times he kicked her out, she would always come back. After her words, the girl got very angry. There were tears in her eyes. She asked the young man if magicians were so insensitive that he didn't care about her. She hit the hero's chest with her fists and angrily asked why the hell he was so kind to her. The young man felt pain. The hero realized that this pain was much more painful than any wound he had. He saw a tearful and very upset winged girl in front of him. The young man wondered if Nephi wanted to come back to him after all he had said to her. Remembering the old days with Nephi, the hero realized that he knew that despite the ears that gave her away, Nephi had special feelings for such a vile villain like him. The magician lowered his head in frustration. The young man thanked the girl, because her words brought him to his senses. The girl with wings was very surprised by his words. After that, the hero confirmed her words and agreed that magicians are a rabble. He added that they only think about themselves, the rest are nothing more than tools for them. He supplemented his speech by saying that magicians can take their lives and not blink an eye. His words greatly surprised the girl. The young man clenched his hand into a fist and said that they, magicians, should only think about their own benefits. The hero turned around epically and added that Nephi belongs to him and his punishment will fall on the idiot who touches her. He added that he would have to get his hands dirty, but magicians are so sinful creatures. If you have to use the power and authority of the Lord to protect her, then so be it. His words startled the winged maiden. After these words, the magician conjured a large magic circle on the ground. He arrogantly turned to the girl and said that he would save Nephi. The hero asked the girl if she would go with him. Virgo confidently replied that she would go with him, because Nephi was her friend. The young man was a little pleased with her words. A trio of knights grabbed hold of the young man and asked him to take them with him and take them to Madame Chastel. Their actions greatly surprised Maga and the winged maiden. The young man agreed to take them with him, but only if they would take their dirty hands off him. The woman noticed in confusion that some kind of shadow had kidnapped the girls and she didn't even know where they were. The magician calmly replied that there was nothing wrong with that. 
The young man added that he knows who is behind this. After that, he added that magicians are indeed incorrigible. Meanwhile, the kidnapped girls were chained to the cave by the wall. Nephi looked pretty exhausted. Shastel abruptly turned towards the girl and asked her how she was feeling. Nephi realized that she was handcuffed. Looking at the shackles, she realized that there was a power in these chains that suppressed magic. She wrapped her arms around her collar and noticed that this power in this collar is not as sophisticated as the one she was wearing before. But her strength is still not enough here. After looking at the chains binding her, she tried to use witchcraft, but it didn't work. After that, a knock was heard from the other end of the cave, to which the girls immediately turned their attention. Footsteps sounded from the dark corridor. The stranger's footsteps alerted the girls. Nephi looked disdainfully at the person who came out of the dark area of the cave and said that she thought he was a friend of the owner. Mr. Barbero stood haughtily in front of the girls. He was surprised by the girls' words. He replied that he would never have thought that such a thing could occur to someone when he sees a couple of magicians. The villain quickly grabbed Nephi by the neck and pulled her towards him. He looked haughtily at the angry Nephi and asked if she had ever heard of Andras the Troublemaker. The magician held the girl's chin in his hand. Barbaros added that Andres was the first magician to be killed by Zagan, and he was his student. Saying these words to the girl, he remembered how he saw the dilapidated corpse of his teacher. His words shocked the girl. Barbaros smiled slyly and hoped that the girl would not misunderstand him. He said that avenging the teacher was not at all in the spirit of magicians. Barbaros' eyes filled with madness, and the magician told the girl that he himself would have killed him someday if Zagan hadn't done it. The magician released the girl. After that, Barbaros added that the castle that Zagan now owns, the money with which he bought it, and even his knowledge, all this was supposed to become his. The magician exhaled and noticed that he couldn't just drop everything and accept it. Barbaros looked thoughtful and said that at first he tried to incite the church against him, but it turned out so-so. He added that it was too easy to find his subordinates, and he easily eliminated the subordinate that he sent to Zagan. His words surprised Shastel a lot. Horrified, the girl asked Barbaros if she was behind all these kidnappings. Barbaros looked at the girl and asked if she only realized this now. His words angered Chesel. Chastel furiously asked if he had done these terrible things just to set him up. Barbaros forcefully pressed his hand against the wall where the girl was chained. He got close to the girl and arrogantly said that she was mistaken. Barbaros said that this flaying suggested the use of sacrifices. After these words, the magician turned around and headed for the exit. He added that they still wanted to conduct a major ritual. Barbaros turned around and solemnly declared that he had done this to prove to the twelve demon lords that he was the one worthy of becoming the next lord. All he had to do was eliminate the other candidates. The magician added that he was a little worried when the prepared victims were taken away from him, but then he received her. He said that the magical power of the white-haired elf would be enough to open the door. His words alerted Nephi. Nephi looked down in frustration. She lowered her head and said it was all pretty pointless. Barbaros noticed how talkative she was. He asked her if she thought he wouldn't kill her or that Zagan would come to save her. Nephi realized the magician's words and answered in the negative. She added that she did not want her current position to add trouble to the gentleman. She added that this was out of the question. Barbaros arrogantly asked what she was talking about then. Nephi replied that the title of lords had already gone to her master. Her words stunned the magician. Barbaros said aloofly that she was lying. Nephi calmly replied that it was the truth, which is why he got rid of her. Barbaros leaned against the wall in surprise. MG was horrified by what he heard. He said it couldn't be. Then Barbaros realized that Zagan had become the Lord of Demons. The magician summed up that it was not enough for Zagan to steal Andra's legacy from him, so now he also took the throne of the Lord. Barbaros pressed his hand to his forehead, he was angry. The magician's condition horrified Nephi. The magician forcefully pulled on the chains and ordered the elf to stand up. Nephi fell to the floor of the cave. Barbaros viciously said that he would just take the title away from him if he completed the ritual. The magician led the girl into a large room with a huge and complex magic circle on the floor. He added that he would not care if he was the lord or not. Shastel shouted after the magician to stop and use her. She added that she was ready for this when she became a knight. Barbaros looked haughtily at the chain Shastel and replied that he would have found a use for her even without her reminders, but only the best tools were needed for the ritual. Hearing his words, Nephi fell into despair. She was replaying Barbaros's words in her head. She remembered her childhood and that she had been called that all her life. After that, she realized that her master had never called her a tool, not once. The elf tried to run away and screamed at the magician to let her go. She wanted to survive and return to her master. Even if he scolded and chased her, she would still resist and be with him in the castle. 
She wanted to cook for him and lay him on her lap and do everything to make him count. Her actions angered Barbaros and he forcefully pulled the chains down. Nephi fell to the floor. She understood that maybe her life was insignificant. Maybe the day would come when he would find someone he would value more than her. She told herself that she would not leave her master alone. Nephi got up from the ground and said that it didn't hurt at all. When he chased her away, the pain was much worse. Barbaros calmly watched the girl's actions. Nephi growled and began to gather her strength. The elf, with tears in her eyes, declared that she belonged only to the owner and added that he had no right to touch her. The magician smiled and began to collect mana in his fingers. Barbaros conjured a huge black flame with the intention of punishing Nephi. There was an explosion behind the magician which broke through the wall of the cave, which stupefied the villain. Barbaros turned around in surprise. There was a fountain in the window that had been formed. He told Nephi that it was an excellent speech. Zagan arrogantly added that it was arrogantly why she was his student. Zagan turned to Barbaros. He asked him how long they had not seen each other. Barbaros was extremely displeased with his appearance. He haughtily straightened up and asked when Zagan had guessed this. Zagan calmly entered the cave. He replied that he began to suspect something when he showed up to skin. Zagan also added that the magician who fell at his feet, tremblingly begging for mercy, was unable to break through his barrier. He also recalled that after the Flenser incident and after the clash with the knights, Barbaros claimed to be trying to make sure of something. Zagan added that it would be strange not to suspect him. The villain was confused when he heard his answer. Zagan said that this was not the point now and turned his gaze to the elf in tears. After that, Zagan cast a cruel look at Barbaros and rhetorically asked if he had touched Nephi. There was a loud explosion. The villain got confused and began to conjure. The young man quickly closed the distance with the kidnapper and hit him on the arm, which the latter was greatly surprised by. The actions of the enemy exasperated Barbaros. After that, Zagan quickly kicked the villain in the legs. Barbaros screamed in pain, and Zagan headed for Nephi. On the way, he removed the shackles from his maid. Zagan came closer to Nephi and asked if it hurt her. Nephi stared at the gentleman in a daze. She confirmed his fears. The elf clung to her master and assumed that he was in much more pain than she was. Her words surprised the magician greatly. Nephi added that he didn't know what had happened to him and when he said he didn't need her anymore, she decided that she just had to put up with it. Nephi, in tears, put her head against the chest of the owner and said that she simply could not find a place for herself, knowing how much he was in pain. After that, she asked Zagan not to shut himself in like that. Zagan looked humbly at the slave. At this time, Barbaros began to get up from the floor. Zagan's opponent pressed his hand to the floor and conjured a magic circle on it. He arrogantly asked if Zagan thought he had already won. Nephi, confused, turned her master's attention to the enemy. Zagan calmly told her not to worry. He looked at Barbaros and said that nothing would happen. The magic circle under the magician's feet disappeared. The disappearance of the spell surprised Barbaros greatly. He tried to cast another spell, but his magic evaporated again. Barbaros didn't understand what was going on, because he was using the spell correctly. Nephi was shocked, she didn't know what was going on. Zagan reminded the maid how they had discussed with her the strongest spell that could theoretically exist. He talked about adding his chains to magic circles, taking control of other people's spells. There is one trick that can achieve a similar result. He added that it is enough to create exactly the same sigil as the enemy, and add your own circle to it. Zagan looked haughtily at the confused and angry Barbaros. He added that then a resonance-like effect would change the spell. Zagan remembered that he first used magic when he was eight years old, when he killed Andrus. He memorized the spell that Andrus the Troublemaker used to catch him and drew it in blood on his palm. It was just a childish trick. A layman mindlessly copying a form should not be able to use magic. And yet, when the magician caught up with him while trying to escape, Zagan used the same spell against the lightning that was supposed to kill him. At that moment, the resonating magic reflected in Andras and killed him. Perhaps it was just an accident, a miracle born from two identical spells created with a split-second difference. The boy wondered if it was possible not only to reflect magic, but also to redirect it with the help of another. That's when Zagan began his research. Barbaros got up and said it was impossible. He asked if this was Andra's legacy. The magician added that if he had known this, he would still be alive. Barbaros was furious. After that, he conjured a huge number of powerful magic circles in the air. The villain asked Zagan who he was. Zagan looked sharply at the enemy. He instantly erased all the opponent's magic circles, which horrified the latter. Barbaros did not believe in what was happening. He knew that this was the first time Zagan had seen this magic. Barbaros realized that Zagan had immediately copied all his magic in the blink of an eye. 
The hero realized that this magic is amazing and terrifying and even a beginner can use it. Zagan understood that even a beginner could cause a resonance if he prepared in advance, but he developed this ability even further. Zagan conjured white magic circles in the air and drew his enemy's attention to them. He said they were sigils that would transform all the spells he was currently using. Zagan added that so far he can only redirect them to physical enhancement, his ability, but he will continue to improve this ability. Barbaros realized in horror that his opponent had absorbed his magic. Zagan took a step towards the enemy and notified him that he had finally been awarded the title. Zagan tightened his hand into a fist and added that he was now called the Killer of Magicians. Zagan struck the air and Barbaros received a powerful wave of magic in his stomach. Magic circles were placed in front of the Zagan and a powerful blow fell on Barbaros. The outcome of the battle surprised Nephi greatly. The defeated magician lay among the rubble and groaned. Barbaros realized that no magician could match Zagan in physical enhancement, because he had absorbed even his protective magic. The exhausted magician looked at Zagan. He realized that if he struck, even the Lord would not stand. Zagan took a sharp step towards the defeated Barbaros. The magician knelt down and asked Zagan to stop, and also stated that he was giving up. Zagan continued walking towards the defeated enemy. Barbaros swore that he would give him all his knowledge and he would never see him again. Zagan did not stop, which horrified the magician. Barbaros backed away in a panic. He looked at his enemy and told him that they were friends. Hearing the words of the loser, Zagan smiled. He raised his fist up and used a spell. Then he asked Barbaros if there was such a thing among magicians. After his question, he hit the ground. The flash from the blow blinded Nephi and reached the six, which the winged maiden was desperately trying to free from her shackles. Zagan's blow landed just to the right of Barbaro's head. This shocked the latter. Zagan smiled and said he was just joking. The defeated magician stood up and asked the enemy what it meant. Zagan looked thoughtful and said that he had no reason to kill him. He noticed that if Barbaros died, he would have nowhere to get all the delicious booze, and he was not good at it. The magician took an angry grin and asked if Zagan felt sorry for him. His opponent smiled arrogantly and said that he had the right to do so. His words offended Barbaros. Barbaros screamed that if he let him live, he would kill him, he would definitely kill him. He won't rest until Zagan is breathing. Zagan looked kindly at the magician and said that let it stay that way. Now Barbaros will owe a bottle every time he loses. His words stunned the enemy and he asked what the hell he was talking about. The beaten Barbaros did not know what he hoped for, leaving the enemy alive. Zagan noticed that the demon lord obeying the rules was ridiculous. After that, he added that he would do whatever he wanted and if Nephi wanted to live under this sun without hiding, then he only needed to rule everything that it illuminated. Nephi listened enthusiastically to her master's words. Zagan added that he would not kill Barbaros if he did not like something, then he would bend it to his will with his strength. Barbaros looked at the winner distantly. He soon accepted defeat and called the enemy an arrogant asshole. Zagan looked at the beaten magician and asked who the lord would be without his pride. The girls happily watched the hero. The magic circle on which the guys were standing lit up. This greatly surprised Zagan. He exhaled and asked the magician if it was his doing. Barbaros looked at the circle in confusion. He replied that he had done nothing. His answer startled Zagan even more. Zagan looked at the defeated enemy. The hero assumed that when he struck the ground, he accidentally touched the magic circles. Meanwhile, the circle was activated and glowing. Zagan pulled Barbaros towards him and drew attention to the strange mana. Zagan looked at Barbaros in horror and asked what he was trying to do. Barbaros replied that this thing was supposed to summon real demons. A creature of an incomprehensible shape came out of the portal. There is a theory that magical symbols and perhaps even church symbols are ancient writings left by gods and demons. Zagan wondered if they could really summon something that had long since disappeared from this world. The circle glowed brighter and brighter. The sight of the monster terrified everyone present. The monster stretched out to the top, surprising the magicians with its height. Zagan is horrified, he suspects that this is just a shadow. Zagan suggested that the lack of casualties and accidental activation prevented the draft. He was terrified that his assumptions might be correct. Zagan was stunned by the sight of the creature. He laughed nervously. The hero realized that people are not equal to this monster. The young man realized that meeting the monster would be death for him. After his reasoning, the monster bowed its head in front of Zagan. The monster was waiting for orders from Zagan, addressing him as his master. After the creature's words, the young man was stunned. He and the rest of the people in the cave did not understand what was happening. He was very surprised that it bowed down before him. A moment later, he realized that the monster had bowed before the seal of the demon lord. He was greatly surprised by this outcome. He didn't realize what he was actually able to inherit. 
The knights were crying with joy because their mistress was fine. One of them furiously said that they primarily care about Madame Chessel and the safety of the townspeople and they do not like to act in concert with the villain. Zagan listened to them with a calm expression on his face and asked them to leave. The knights were greatly offended by the magician's attitude. The warriors reminded Zagan that they had helped them get out of the cave. At this time, the winged girl turned to the magician. The girl said that the two of them, the magician and Nephi, should discuss everything thoroughly. After these words, the women flew to the knights and said goodbye to the guys, leaving Nephi in disbelief and Zagan in thought. Zagan turned to Barbaros and asked if he wanted to continue. Dejectedly, Barbaros asked what he expected of him after meeting this creature. He remembered how the monster had returned somewhere, most likely back to its own world. When Zagan gave the order, Barbaros got up from the ground and began to recall Zagan's words. He asked if he needed to bring a drink as an apology. Zagan smiled and confirmed his words, and also added that he expects a drink of the highest category from him. Barbaros looked at the guys dejectedly and used disappearing spells. Zagan and Nephi were a little discouraged by his disappearance. The guys were left alone. Zagan realized his position and blushed. Nephi turned to the owner, which put the latter in a stupor. He did not know what to do or what to say. Nephi calmly said that she wanted to be near her master. Her words surprised Zagan a little. The young man reminded her that she should not force herself and asked if the girl was sure of her decision. Nephi pressed her hand to her heart and replied that she didn't mind if it was him. Zagan looked at the thoughtful elf. The hero looked at Nephi looking at the sunset and assumed that she had become much stronger. Zagan turned around and said that everything would be different now. His words surprised Nephi a little. Zagan got down on one knee and said that now he wanted her to call him by his first name from now on and not the master. Nephi looked at her master in surprise. The young man confusedly added that he did not want her to be his slave, servant and pupil. He said that he wanted exactly the kind of relationship he wanted between them. His words confused the girl. Nephi pressed her hand to her heart and began to speak uncertainly. Zagan confusedly added that this is exactly the kind of relationship he wants. The young man bowed his head in front of the girl and tried several times to say something to her in embarrassment. After several attempts, Zagan screamed and got up from his knees, which greatly surprised his companion. Zagan came closer to the girl and took her by the shoulders. The young man, embarrassed, said that she belonged to him forever until death separated them and even after death. His words greatly confused Nephi. After these words, Zagan became desperate and stepped aside. Zagan didn't understand why he couldn't just say I love you. Nephi smiled. After that, she happily replied that she agreed. The girl's smile greatly surprised the young man. Nephi began to search for something in the pocket of her work dress. The girl took a collar out of her dress and asked Zagan to put it on her again. Her words greatly surprised the young man. He said that it was terrible, because it was a slave collar. The elf looked at the collar and said that there was nothing wrong with that. She almost called the young man her master, but quickly came to her senses. Nephi came closer to the hero and told him that this was what connected them and called the young man by name. Zagan listened attentively to his companion. Zagan smiled and put his hands on Nephi's shoulders. Nephi awkwardly said that it was quite strange to call it an engagement ring. Nephi and Zagan looked at each other. After that, Nephi asked what kind of relationship they were in if she was not a slave, a servant, or a student. Her words brought Zagan into a stupor. Zagan froze in disbelief, he himself would like to know. Nephi stared at the hero in silence. Zagan put his hand to his embarrassed face. The hero realized that he, the lord of demons, had taken an elf slave to wife. He didn't know how to love her. Nephi and Zagan looked at the distant sun together. Zagan would like someone to tell him about it. Meanwhile, the city was bustling with life. The men in the tavern were having a good time and one of them asked his interlocutors if they had heard about the new ruler. His interlocutor asked if he was talking about the magician who lives in the lost forest. He also noticed that this magician had a creepy face. At this time, the man on the street wondered if he was the Lord of Kyanid, since the magician was the heir of Marchosis. His interlocutor replied that lately he even comes in to buy things. The boy next to them agreed with the statement of the second man and noticed that the magician always brings a cute elf with him. The boy bumped into and apologized. Behind the boy stood a huge lizard in armor and a black cloak. The men apologized to the lizard and ran away in fear. An unknown lizard noticed that a new demon lord had appeared. Zagan was in the library and held one of the many books in his hands. His lord seal gave the signal. Zagan noticed this and remembered about the monster. He understood that there was something called a demon in this world and there was a seal before which he bowed. Zagan summed up that after half a month of research, 
he had not found any clues among the population of Marhosis. Sagan continued to stand in front of the library wall, thinking. The door to the room opened behind him. Nephi entered the library and stealthily began to approach the fountain. Nephi suddenly grabbed Zagan by the back and asked him to guess who it was. Zagan didn't react at all to her attempt to scare her. The young man turned towards the girl and looked at her. The elf froze in disbelief. After that, she blushed and she asked what she should do. Zagan replied that he didn't know what to do next either. With a sullen expression on his face, he asked what she would achieve with this. Nephi confusedly said that she hoped to scare him. Nephi added confusedly that Zagan had been looking tired lately and so she hadn't even thought about it. Zagan noticed with the most sullen mood that she wanted to cheer him up and added that it was very nice. The young man told himself that he really wanted to hug her and asked if she wanted something. Nephi remembered something. The elf took the young man to the kitchen and told him that their lunch was ready. There was a sumptuous lunch on the table. Zagan looked at the cooked food with surprise. He noticed that Nephi's cooking was becoming more diverse. Nephi said that for an appetizer they have a salad of tomatoes and herbs with Caesar sauce and grated cheese to add flavor, as well as buns baked from rye flour. Zagan drew attention to the fact that their first course was consomme with oatmeal, and the main dish was stewed lamb. The young man broke the delicious bun in half and ate a piece of it. After he tasted the dish, he and Nephi exhaled with delight. Nephi and Zagana were sitting at the table. The young man said that it had never occurred to him that food could be so delicious. Nephi replied that Zagan repeats this every time. Zagan was eating his delicious lunch. Nephi added that she made egg pudding for dessert. Her words caught Zagan's attention. Nephi said Minwela taught her that. It is made on fire by mixing eggs with sour cream. Her answer confused Zagan, and he asked the girl if the store owner had taught her anything strange. Nephi remembered how they tried on outfits and informed Zagan that in exchange for the recipe, Manuela asked her to try on a couple of revealing outfits. Zagan replied that this is what scares him. Nephi noticed that there was nothing wrong with that, because only Manuela had seen her. Zagan said that's not the problem. There was a delicious dessert in front of the young man. Zagan put a spoonful of dessert in his mouth and noticed that it looked like a boiled egg. The taste of the dessert amazed the young man. He got up from his chair and shouted how delicious it was. His words pleased Nephi. Zagan was ecstatic about the taste of the dish. He noticed how huge the world was and also noticed that he could not even think that there was something sweet. After that, Zagan looked warily to the side. The barrier of his castle was breached. Zagan wondered who it could be and suggested that he needed to meet a guest. Nephi did not understand what was going on and looked at her master warily. Zagan replied to the girl that she should not worry about this. After that, a huge lizard, previously encountered by the townspeople on the street, broke through the wall of his castles. The lizard was smashing the castle wall. Nephi warily drew attention to this. Zagan said that this guest is very impatient. The young man noted that the scoundrel was able to bypass all the traps and praised the visitor's skills. A huge armored lizard entered the dining room. He turned to the hero and asked if he was the new demon lord. Zagan replied that before asking anything, he should introduce himself and remembered that they had met at the auction. This lizard was Vale Fargosly, one of the candidates for the title of demon lord. The lizard furiously declared that he would now crush Zagan and take his power for himself. Zagan angrily replied that he was having lunch now and ordered Valefar to wait until he finished. Hearing the young man's words, the guest laughed. Nephi looked from Zagan to Valefar in confusion. She said she could cook more. Zagan, continuing to eat his lunch, replied that he would be only glad. But now he does not want to break away from eating. Valefar released his sharp claws and rushed at Zagan, telling him that he should not underestimate him. The lizard's blow landed on the magician's arm, which did not confuse the latter. Zagan realized that this hand was clearly not magic. Valefar prepared to deliver a powerful blow to Zagan. The young man said in a rage that he had warned the lizard and ordered him to stop, because Dirk could get on the food. The young man struck a crushing blow at the opponent and threw him aside. Zagan realized that he had spoken aloud what he was thinking. He thought that in the future there would only be more uninvited guests, and he might need to strengthen the protection of his possessions. At this time, Valefar already fell to the floor. The helmet flew off the opponent's head, which attracted Nephi's attention. She came closer, to which Zagan turned his attention. He told Nephi to leave him alone, because he wouldn't wake up. Nephi replied that that was not the point. It turned out that a little girl with horns was wearing armor. Nephi said she was just a child. The sight of the girl surprised Nephi and Zagan. Manuela was holding underwear in her hands, she asked about dessert. She was hiding behind a curtain, covering her naked body. She said with a smile that she wanted to cook something new for Mr. Zargan. Manuela replied coquettishly that it was a great idea, 
and she would help oil with her idea because she was trying on her outfits. After that, Manuela picked up the note and asked her if she could read. Oil gave a positive response. She added that Mr. Zagan had taught her not only magic, but also reading. The girl said it was great news and gave her a dessert recipe. The note contained all sorts of nonsense that Nephi couldn't understand. Manuela laughed and then gave the girl a normal recipe. In front of Nephi and Zagan lay the body of a defeated enemy. The magician realized that she was just a child. After that, he realized that he had knocked out the child and coughed uncertainly. Zagan pointed his finger at the enemy and asked Nephi not to worry, because he had a cold medicine somewhere. Nephi asked the young man to calm down and said that the medicine would not help here. Nephi added that she was just lying unconscious. Zagan asked uncertainly if the girl was going to die. Nephi gave a negative answer. The magician took the girl in his arms and carried her to another room. He said with displeasure that this intruder was a lot of trouble. His decision surprised Nephi, and she smiled after him. She went with him and told the young man that he was very kind. Zagan didn't understand what she was talking about. After a while, the girl woke up in bed. Zagan and Nephi were sitting next to her. She did not understand where she was. When she saw them, she was very surprised. The girl jumped out of bed and hit Zagan in anger. The magician calmly blocked her blow and said that it was better to thank Nephi, because if it hadn't been for her, he would have decapitated her long ago and thrown her far away. The girl was horrified by what she heard. She put her hand down. He knew that he would never have been able to do such a thing with Nephi. Zagan arrogantly asked why she had come here and attacked him. The girl frowned and replied that she wanted to become stronger because she was weak. Zagan calmly confirmed that strength is indeed necessary to survive. He asked her why she had chosen him out of so many people. The girl replied dejectedly that he had only recently become a ruler, moreover, since he was called a killer of magicians, then against those who were not magicians, he should be weak. Zagan confirmed her words and said that he could not suppress the abilities of other races, which were not magic. Nephi looked at the magician, and he cited the example of strong claws and that of light. Zagan looked at the girl and assumed that she was a dragon. His suggestion shocked the girl. Zagan noticed that some of the dragons were still alive and added that her strength would grow with age. Zagan noticed that she was behaving very strangely, but he did not feel hostility or hatred in her behavior. The drooping girl sat silently in front of the magician. Zagan had an idea. He realized that she was behaving exactly like him when he was caught stealing bread. She found an easy target, as it seemed to her, and rushed into the attack and was almost brought to tears when she was rebuffed. This realization led him into thought. After that, Zagan hostily stretched out his hand to the girl and said that she had come here to challenge the demon lord, and therefore would be punished. His words horrified the girl. She prepared for a harsh punishment, and Nephi was confused when she heard the magician's words. Zagan told the girl to become Nephi's assistant for one week. His decision greatly surprised the ladies present. Zagan sat down on a chair and thought about it. He realized that while she was busy, she could be told what to do and what not to do. He may not have the skills to explain the concepts of good and evil to her, but at least he will be able to explain to her the rules that a villain should follow. And even if she doesn't change her mind after that, it won't be his concern anymore. Realizing Zagan's words, the girl wanted to say something. The magician was in anticipation of her words. The girl asked uncertainly if he would eat it. Her question greatly confused Nephi and Zagan. The girl clenched her dress in fear. She added that she had heard that people could become stronger if they ate flesh or drank dragon blood. Zagan said that such legends really exist. He understood why she was hiding her identity. The magician arrogantly replied that all he would get by eating such small fry was an unpleasant taste in his mouth. Tears appeared in the girl's eyes, which confused the magician. Wearily, he put his hand to his face and said that was why he did not like children. The magician wondered what the elders from the slums would do in such a situation. He remembered his childhood. He remembered how, as a child, the children shared bread with him. He realized and asked Nephi if they had anything left from lunch. Nephi brought him a bowl of soup. The girl looked at the plate of food in front of her with disgust. Zagan said that it was charity when the strong showed compassion to the weak and asked the girl if she had heard of such a thing. His words angered the girl. Zagan frowned heavily and warned the girl that he could not stand people who did not appreciate food, especially the one that Nephi had prepared. He was ready to kill them on the spot. His words horrified the girl. She took the spoon in her hands with displeasure and put a spoonful of soup in her mouth. After tasting the soup, she was very surprised. 
The girl looked into the soup and said it was very tasty. Zagan replied resentfully that this soup was delicious because Nephi had made it. Nephi thanked the guest for the praise. The girl began to eat soup with great pressure. Zagan and Nephi looked at her meal in silence. When the girl finished the soup, the magician exhaled, and the elf smiled. After that, Zagan got up from his chair and headed for the exit. Walking to the door, the young man said that he would return to his archives and ordered the girl to start helping Nephi as soon as she finished eating. The girl stopped Zagan and asked if he thought she might attack Nephi or run away. Zagan replied that she could do as she pleased. He added that she should understand what awaits her if she runs away from a man who knows her secret. After these words, Zagan smiled slyly and suggested that she did not fully understand something and informed the girl that Nephi was much stronger than her. His answer greatly surprised the girl and made Nephi laugh. Zagan was walking down the corridor. He realized that they had not prepared the guest room for nothing in case Nephi's friends came. He remembered how Nephi had asked him about Mr. Barbaros and how he had told her that they would not let him go there. Remembering all this, Zagan recalled Shastel. He wondered if she was okay after the incident. Meanwhile, in the castle, a high-ranking person asks Shastel if she's sure she won't change her mind. Shastel replied that she would not be able to change her mind, because the magician Zagan had already saved her twice and she could not just turn a blind eye to it. Shin listened to the girl's reply and formally addressed Shastel. He announced that Shastel Lilkvist would be permanently stripped of the title of Captain of the Holy Knights from now on. His words upset Shastel. Shastel and the three knights of the Azure Sky stood in front of the Epicope. From that moment on, Shastel Lilquist was stripped of the title of Captain of the Holy Knights. The knights began to beg the bishop to reverse his decision. They asked his eminence Clavel to wait and pay attention to everything that Shastel has achieved at this point in time. Shastel shouted at her subordinates. Her answer greatly surprised and upset the knights. Shastel suggested that her detachment from them was more important than the appearance of a new demon lord. This means that the church needed Zagan's murder only to demonstrate its strength. Shastel assumed that everything here was really rotten already and clenched her hand into a fist. Virgo realized that if she had continued to point her sword only where she was ordered and did not express everything openly, but acted more covertly, then everything would have been different. She remembered Zagan's words when he was saving Nephi. The girl boldly looked ahead and told herself that she would not compromise her principles. The bishop exhaled and said that this decision was not easy for him. He went down to the girl and put his hand on her shoulder. The bishop asked Chastel to be patient and assured her that he would come up with something. His words touched the former captain of the knights. She looked down with relief and realized that there were still people in the church who cared. The bishop added that he can only protect her from the influence of politics, but they have another problem. The old man reported that the owner of the Holy Sword, Raphael Hirandella, nicknamed Terrifying, was heading here. He was a huge, mustachioed man with heavy armor and a two-handed sword at an advantage. His words surprised Shastel a lot. Clavel assumed that Shastel must have heard about his cruelty. He said he didn't know what Raphael wanted, but there were unpleasant rumors. Shastel realized that the man they called Terrifying had been sent after her, the apostate. There is only one reason for such a meeting, Elimination. Shastel was in turmoil. Meanwhile, in Zagan's castle, the hero stealthily watched the girls work. He hoped that nothing bad would happen. At that time, Nephi and Veilfar were hanging up the laundry. Veilfar was holding a basket of laundry in her hands. She embarrassedly asked Nephi if she had made that soup herself. Nephi, hanging up the laundry, gave a positive answer. The girl confusedly told her that the soup was delicious. After that, Veilfar told Nephi that she could just call her foul, which surprised the elf a little. She smiled sweetly at the girl. All this time, Zagan was watching and listening attentively. Nephi said she would call her foul and asked the girl if she was afraid of Mr. Zagan. Fall replied that his face did not frighten her and added that if he had a wider mouth, he could even be called handsome. Her words surprised Nephi. Fall looked down and added dejectedly that she was afraid of his strength, because she couldn't do anything against him. Nephi smiled and replied that there was nothing wrong with that, because he was not one of those who bragged about his strength. Her words surprised Zagan, who remembered how he burned those bandits and magicians to the ground. Fall asked Nephi why she was here with him. The girl continued to hang out the laundry and replied that Mr. Zagan had bought her, so she came here. After that, she noticed that she considered her a human being, not a slave. She also said she feels like this is her home. Nephi turned to Fall and asked with a smile if she had such a place. Fall looked down in frustration and gave a negative answer. Her answer surprised Nephi and made Zagan think. The young man stood behind a pillar and reminded himself once again why he does not like small fry. 
A few days have passed. Tfal helped Nephi with the housework. She swept the dust in hard-to-reach places, carried plates and chopped vegetables. Sometimes she noticed Nephi and Zagan flirting with each other. Thalefar became less wary of everything. She worked hard and didn't even complain. Zagan watched her actions with caution. Zagan was sitting in his library and holding a magical grimoire in his hands. The young man looked at the book with boredom. He did not need information in it. Then the hero realized that he could only comb through the castle of Marchosis. Zagan understood that the lord, who had lived for a thousand years, could not help but have even the slightest interest in demons, which means it is hidden somewhere. The young man put the book back on the shelf and thought that he could use the advice of another magician. The door to the library opened, and Fowl stood behind it, who informed the young man that lunch was ready. Zagan replied that he would be right there. After that, the baby entered the room and approached the magician from behind. She languidly asked if he was afraid that she would attack him from behind. Zagan turned around carelessly and looked at the girl. He remembered the words of his former enemy Barbaros and grinned. The magician informed the Fowl that he had already had a similar conversation recently, and then he said that his enemy could try to do it at any time. Fall listened to Zagan warily. The young man added that he would give her the same answer. Zagan told her to attack whenever she wanted, but every time she was defeated, her sentence would increase. His answer surprised the girl. Zagan, Nephi and Fall were having lunch together at the table. Nephi asked the girl if she liked lunch. Fall responded positively. The baby ate her portion with appetite and turned to Zagan. She apologized for interrupting his lunch that day. Zagan let out a resentful sigh. He was a little glad that Fowl realized her mistakes. The hero assumed that the Fowl would now be dealt with. He turned to Nephi. Zagan said that tomorrow he would take her with him to the castle of Marhosis. His words infuriated the Fowl. She asked Zagan if he was laughing at her. She added that giving all the knowledge of the Lord is almost the same thing. Fall recalled that he had recently let her into his library, which any magician values as his own life. She angrily asked Zagan if he thought she was incapable of stealing something. The young man continued to eat his lunch calmly. He asked what would happen when she did that and immediately added that he wouldn't care. After that, the hero said that he himself killed the magician who lived in this castle and took possession of his knowledge. Fall was at a complete loss. She awkwardly said that he had enough strength to just subdue her. Zagan replied that he didn't care how many dragon years she had lived or how skilled she was in magic. The young man added that she was just a child to him. Nephi calmly listened to their conversation. Zagan was uncomfortable with the fact that in fact, Nephi would just be upset if he did that. There were tears in Fall's eyes. Zagan and Nephi were greatly surprised by the baby's tears. The young man jumped up from his chair and assumed that she was crying because of him. Fall paid special attention to the fact that Zagan called her a child. The magician patted Fowl on the head and asked him not to cry. Zagan began stroking the fowl's head with even greater effort. He invited them all to just eat and asked them to try the fowl dishes that Nephi had prepared, assuring her that then she would stop crying. Fall wiped away her tears and said she wasn't crying. Zagan exhaled and sat down wearily on a chair. He said that being the demon lord's henchman wasn't so bad for her. He asked fully what the purpose of her visit was, because there aren't many fools who would want to contradict him. Fall stood silently in front of Zagan. The young man added that she could address him as you. Fall replied in confusion that Zagan could call her Fall. Her statement slightly surprised the young man and pleased Nephi. After a while, Fall fell asleep. Zagan noticed that the girl fell asleep right after lunch and even though she is a dragon, but the child remains a child. Nephi added that Mr. Zagan had convinced her that they were not her enemies and therefore she calmed down. She recalled those days and freely said that when she first came here, she felt the same way. Zagan replied in confusion that it was because she belonged to him, and he was worried about his things. After his words, Zagan wilted greatly. The young man realized that he had called her a thing again. Nephi confusedly said that she was aware of this and thanked the gentleman. Later, Zagan noticed that Fowl was holding a spoon in his hands. The young man took the spoon out of the sleeping girl's hands, and she grabbed his fingers. In a dream, the girl turned to her father, which greatly surprised Zagan and Nephi. The hero assumed that she was dreaming about her parents and Nephi noticed the fingers clenched foul. This made Nephi laugh, and Zagan didn't know how to react to it. After that, the girl did not thoughtfully say that they really had a child. Zagan was very confused by her words. He focused on the child that Nephi had said. After a few seconds, Nephi realized her words and began to feel embarrassed. Nephi, extremely embarrassed, said that she did not mean anything wrong and added in confusion that he was like a guardian or protector for her. Zagan awkwardly replied that he understood everything and she didn't need to worry. Zagan and Nephi stared at the floor in confusion. 
The elf's face was covered with blush. She awkwardly took Zagan's sleeve. The young man was in great embarrassment. She was spinning conversations in her head about both the family and the child. He understood that a master who craves such ordinary happiness is ridiculous. After that, he took Nephi's hand. He hoped that one day they would find this happiness. Manuela was very happy about something. She was in Kayanita's studio. In front of her was a fowl in cute clothes with a hood imitating a cat's head. Manuela rushed to hug the fowl. She praised herself for the great choice of clothes and really wanted to take the fowl to her home. Zagan began to take the girl away from the winged girl, asking her to calm down and noticing that a fowl is not a thing. Leaving the store, Zagan remembered that before heading to the Marhosis castle, they decided to buy clothes for fall because she couldn't wander around in armor, and she only had underwear under armor. After leaving Manuela's store, Zagan said that was why he didn't like her store. Nephi replied that in her opinion, coming here was the right decision. Manuela waved happily at her friends as they left. Nephi drew the young man's attention to something. She pointed to the fowl, which was very pleased with the purchase. She drew the young man's attention to the girl's joy, after which the latter turned to him and thanked him. Zagan awkwardly replied that there was nothing to thank him for. After that, Fowl took the young man by the hand. Little Fall modestly grabbed Nephi and Zagan in her arms. This surprised them a little. This feeling caused confusion in the young man. Zagan realized that this feeling was different from his feelings for Nephi, and there was something warm about it. After these thoughts, the young man was greatly surprised. He looked at the Fowl and assumed that this was the desire to protect. He couldn't believe it, because he shouldn't have such feelings left in him. Fall looked at the young man questioningly, noticing his gaze on her. Zagan, Nephi and Fall walked down the street holding hands, which attracted the attention of local residents. Zagan knew that if Barbaros found out, he would think that he had completely lost his mind. Meanwhile, Chisel was also outside, sighing sadly. She thought about how stupid she had been. The holy sword was taken from her as well as her armor. She realized that because of her suspension, they had to postpone the formation of a squad to eliminate the demon lord. Although even so she would hardly hear words of gratitude from Zagan. She accepted it and realized that she still wanted to help them in some way. Shastel hesitantly put her hand on her shoulder and wondered where she got such a desire. Shastel wanted them to live peacefully and become a happy family. She did not want to get between them. Shastel hoped that the guys would remember her and remember her from time to time. That would be enough for her. The girl imagined their future child, her funeral and grave. The thought brought tears to her eyes. Shastel continued walking through the city. She confidently said that Zagan would become a loving father, such as his aura. Zagan and his company were walking in front of her. The young man asked Fall if she really liked the clothes. The girl gave a positive answer. Shastel confirmed her own words and looked at her friends coming to meet her. Zagan, Nephi, Fowl and Shastel crossed paths. Shastel was greatly surprised by their appearance. Zagan drew attention to the former captain of the knights. Fowl did not understand what was going on. Shastel confusedly asked Zagan and Nephi when they had already had a baby. Her question confused the couple very much. Zagan shouted at Shastel not to utter such shamelessness out loud. His answer surprised the girl greatly. Fall asked Zagan who this girl was and pointed to the confused Shastel. Her question slightly discouraged the young man and he apologized and then thought about it. He looked at Shastel and asked her who she was. His question wounded the girl to the depths of her soul and she burst into tears. Shastel was depressed. She did not understand why Zagan did not remember her at all. Nephi angrily turned to Zagan and told him that it was Shastel. The young man was very surprised. He couldn't recognize Shastel at all in these clothes and without armor. He told Shastel that this was Nephi's friend and asked the girl what she was wearing. Shastel didn't know how to answer her. There was a shout from behind the girl who was addressing her. It was the three knights of the azure sky. One of the knights told his mistress that it was dangerous to walk alone here. After that, he noticed Zagan and got upset. Zagan was also not happy about their appearance and called the knights three idiots of the azure sky. The three warriors corrected Zagan and asked confusedly what Zagan wanted to do with Mrs. Shastel. Their question discouraged the young man. Fowl glared at the warriors, which Zagan quickly managed to pay attention to. The young man noticed how the girl prepared for battle and used her skill. He ordered her to stop. Fall looked at him angrily. She asked the young man why she shouldn't attack the offenders. Zagan replied that there were a lot of Nephi's acquaintances here and there would be unnecessary sacrifices. His words calmed the girl a little. The knights took their mistress away from the Zagan and asked her to be careful in the future. Shastel resisted the warrior's actions. Zagan and the company silently watched them go. Nephi asked anxiously if Shastel was going to be okay. 
Zagan replied that he had no idea, but it seems that she has plenty of fans, which means she has someone to rely on. Zagan understood that by contacting a magician, she would only harm herself. The hero turned his attention to the fowl and asked her what was wrong with the knights. Fall glared at the young man and asked what was strange about the magician's dislike of holy knights. Zagan replied that it was quite normal. The company of the magician and Shastel dispersed. Zagan hoped that this would not lead to problems in the future. After a while, they found themselves in front of the castle. The view of the fortress delighted the fowl. She was surprised that such a huge thing was underground. Zagan replied that this fortress used to be above it, but then, probably by the magic of Marchosis, the castle was moved here. Fall looked at Marchosis with delight. This fortress seemed extremely familiar to Fall. The girl went forward to the castle, which caused Zagan's surprise. The baby came up to the castle wall and said that dragons once lived here. Her words surprised the young man. Fall added that this cave is similar to the one where she used to live, and there is the same smell of magic here. Her answer made the young man a little happy. Zagan asked her to inform him about everything in the castle related to dragons in the future and added that she could take any books that she liked. Fall agreed with his suggestion. The trio opened the front door and saw a long dark corridor in front of them. Fall and Nephi were wary, but Zagan felt completely calm. They walked forward along the corridor. Knox in the main hall scared Nephi, and she grabbed Zagan by his clothes. The young man took the elf by the hand. Fowl drew her friend's attention to something strange. In front of them stood a giant stone statue of an incomprehensible creature. Zagan replied that it was a golem or chimera, a magical creature. Nephi suggested that it might be guarding this place. Zagan replied that such an option was quite possible, but it seems that with the death of Marhosis, it froze itself. The young man added that it was better for them not to touch the creature once again. Suddenly it would come to life and go berserk. He led his companions on. The company left the creatures behind and headed for another corridor. On the way, Fowl noticed something. The girl pointed her finger at the magic circle and asked Zagan if it would fit. The young man was surprised by her question and asked the baby again. Fowl replied that it was the formula of the dragons. Zagan was greatly surprised by her answer. Fowl added that Zagan asked to be informed about everything. For this, the magician stroked the girl's head and praised her. Fall immediately approached Nephi and boasted that she had been praised. Nephi did not stay away and also supported the baby. The young man looked thoughtfully at the circle. Zagan asked Fall if she knew what he was for. The girl suggested that it might be a door. After that, the hero asked her if she could activate it. The girl happily confirmed his words. Fowl came closer to the circle and activated it. Nephi began to stare at Zagan, which attracted the latter's attention. The young man asked the girl what was bothering her. The elf was embarrassed. The confused look of the virgin alerted and slightly blushed the hero. He assumed that Nephi wanted something too, and after a second he guessed. Zagan held out his hand and sternly ordered Nephi to freeze in place. The young man suddenly stroked Nephi's head. The girl was surprised by the guy's decision. She was glad of Zagan's action. The young man suggested that Nephi became a little jealous when he praised the fowl, although nothing like that happens when we are alone. Zagan enjoyed stroking the contented Nephi on the head. The couple caught the fowl's eye and quickly came to their senses. The young man asked the girl what she needed. Fall tediously replied that she had opened the door. The embarrassed Nephi silently stared at the floor, and the confused Zagan praised the fowl. The three of them went down the stairs. Fall walked in front, while Zagan and Nephi held hands going down. When the trio descended in front of them, they saw a black door. Zagan carefully opened this door. Opening the door in front of him, he smiled contentedly. It was a giant library. The young man said that they had found what they were looking for. Nephi and Fall looked at the room enthusiastically. The hero ordered Nephi to collect here all the books that are mentioned by the demon or on which there is a seal of the Lord. The girl obediently agreed. Zagan paid attention to the Fowl standing behind him. The young man asked her what she wanted. Fall asked if he could read minds. Zagan asked why she had made such a conclusion. Fall remembered how Zagan stroked Nephi's head and said that he knew about Nephi's desire, even though she did not tell him anything. Zagan calmly replied that Nephi always knows what he wants. The young man added that if he could not guess even to such a small thing, he would be ashamed. Fall replied that she was even a little jealous because of this. Zagan noticed that the fowl spoke as if it were not about her. Fall was surprised by what the young man said. He added that he did not know exactly how long dragons lived, but Marhosis had lived for more than a thousand years. Zagan said that in a thousand years she would learn to understand everything without words. Fall looked at the guy in surprise. The girl set aside a period of a thousand years and asked if Zagan would always be with her. 
The young man calmly replied that if she wanted to go somewhere, he would not stop her. Fall abruptly grabbed the hero's arm and clung to him. She said she didn't want to go anywhere. Zagan noticed that he wasn't very good at it himself. Fall noticed a book on the shelf opposite her. She took out the book The Twelve Holy Swords. The title of the book attracted the young man's attention. Zagan snatched the book out of the girl's hands, which the latter was very unhappy with. What he saw in the book amazed Zagan. His guesses were confirmed. He realized that the symbols engraved on the holy swords were the same as those on the Lord's seal. Zagan realized that he had already felt that he had met the symbols from the seal of the demon lord somewhere. The young man happily noticed that the symbols were not identical, but it looked like they had a common origin. The hero realized that if he studied the holy swords, he would learn all about the seal of the demon lord. Zagan praised the fowl for the find. Meanwhile, in the main church of the city of Chastel, and the trinity of the holy knights of the azure sky stood on one in front of an unknown figure. Shastel humbly said that it was an honor for her to meet the captain of the holy knights. Raphael Hirandella stood in front of her. Raphael glowered at the girl and asked if she was called the virgin of the holy sword. He reported that he had heard about her punishment for disobedience. Hirandella noticed that the girl looked quite good. Raphael asked how many magicians the girl had defeated. His question discouraged Chasel. She realized that he had decided to get straight to the point. The girl realized that Raphael Hirandella, the knight who killed more magicians than anyone else, a man who would gladly have dealt with a renegade like her, Shastel decided that she would stand her ground. She replied that she did not consider it something to brag about. Raphael was deeply hurt by her words. The trio of knights asked the lady to choose her words, because even their worthless lives would not protect them for long. One of them called the other two cowards, because they swore to protect her to the end. Raphael smiled and then laughed a lot. He said that no one had talked to him like that for a long time, especially women, she was the first one so brave. After these words, he added that she would be able to brag about it in the afterlife and glared at the girl. The knights blocked Raphael's path to the girl and asked Shastel to run. Suddenly, the bishop entered the hall and addressed Raphael. He asked what he was doing to his knights. His appearance surprised the trio of Azure Sky Knights and Shastel. Raphael turned slowly towards the priest. He glared at Clavel and said he didn't care about him, a man with only a title. Clavel replied that it might be so, but protecting these knights was his responsibility. Raphael menacingly walked towards the old man and asked him if they had taken the holy sword from her. After that, he asked where he was. His question stunned the bishop. He asked what Raphael was going to do when he found out. Furandal replied that he was going to do exactly what he thought and clarified that the holy sword chooses its owner, and until he dies, no one can use it anymore. After that, Raphael pointed his finger at the girl and, as an alternative, offered to execute Shastel. This greatly surprised the girl. The old man shouted that this was an outrageous impertinence. Raphael replied menacingly that this was true, and the priest had no right to tell the owner of the sword how to use it. Shastel said that Mr. Raphael allows himself too much, and if the owners of the swords used them as they pleased, they would be no different from bandits. Raphael glared at the girl. The paladin reached for his sword and noticed that the girl was contradicting him for the second time. His behavior scared Shastel. Raphael took out his sword and told Clavella that his ward was about to lose her life. Clavel reported that he understood Raphael's hint and ordered Chesel to follow him. Clavel and Shastel went to the treasury of the church. The girl was stopped at the entrance by the guards. The priest took something out of the room. The bishop held a sacred sword in his hands. The old man gave the sword to the maiden and said that he was not sure that it should be returned to the owner, and this could only give Raphael a reason to attack. He added that he believes that Shastel has the strength to overcome any obstacle. Shastel took the holy sword in her hands and reported that she understood the saint's plan. The girl understood that this Raphael had forced them to return the sword to her. She didn't know what her formidable comrade was really up to. After a while, in the tavern, someone laughed very loudly in Zagan's face, which exasperated the guy. Zagan was asked if he really has a child. The young man asked dejectedly how he knew about this. After they searched the castle, Barbaros called him to a meeting and so he is back in town. Barbaros arrogantly told about the rumors about how Zagan kidnapped this child. Zagan angrily headed towards the exit, expressing his desire to leave as soon as possible. Barbaros grabbed him by the raincoat and asked him to relax, because he got him a drink, as he asked. A drunken Barbaros asked an acquaintance if he would tell about her. Zagan realized the condition of his drinking companion and replied that Barbaros also knew her. His answer surprised Barbaros very much and he asked if she was also a magician. Barbaros began to sort through the options, realizing that this was a female magician. 
he assumed that it could be Gamori the seductress, but immediately noticed that she did not like men. Zagan was calmly drinking his drink. He believed that if Barbaros did not understand, then the others should not guess that Fowl is Veilfar, and she is a dragon. By this point, Barbaros had already figured it out. Barbaros said it was Veilfar, which surprised Zagan very much. Barbaros added that he was saying this to the fact that Veilfar had recently attacked him. He asked what had become of him. Barbaros added that he was probably alive if he was lucky. The magician assumed that Zagan had expelled him as well. After that, Barbaros said that there was a rumor that he was actually a dragon and even his corpse could be used for excellent ingredients. Zagan silently looked at his interlocutor while drinking a drink. He realized that it was because of people like him that the fowl had to be hidden. Barbaros decided not to think about it and asked who the girl he had sheltered was. This surprised Zagan. The hero hoped that Barbaros was not hinting that he had guessed everything. Zagan replied uncertainly that he did not know and decided that she would just be a child over whom he had taken custody. Barbaros laughed with all his might, singling out the fact that Zagan had taken custody of the child. The young man realized that his drinking companion was simply incorrigible. After that, Barbaros came to his senses and decided to turn the conversation in another direction. Zagan assumed that Barbaros had finally decided to talk about the case. Barbaros turned in his direction and said that he wanted to warn Zagan about a man who would soon arrive at the local church. Barbaros was talking about Raphael, the magician hunter. He is rumored to be called terrifying and there is no one who can match him in the number of magicians killed. He has 499 murders to his credit. Barbaros smiled coquettishly and pointed his finger at Zagan and said that Raphael had decided that he would become his 500th anniversary magician. Zagan replied that it was some kind of ridiculous story. He asked if the owner of the sword could kill so many magicians alone. Barbaros replied that he had no idea. Barbaros added that there is a rumor that Raphael killed and ate a dragon. This greatly surprised Zagan. Zagan remembered Fall's words about the holy knights. The hero clenched his hand into a fist. Barbaros added that the church does not approve of dragon hunting, so it cannot be verified. Zagan replied that Barbaros was unusually talkative today. Barbaros replied that he had come to apologize and brought him the promised tribute. He hugged Zagan and added that it was better for him to live in peace with Zagan than to be on knives. Zagan dejectedly said that Barbaros is very slippery and does not have a drop of dignity. Barbaros poured booze into Zagan's glass and said that he was quite capable, and he could benefit from it. Zagan replied that if Barbaros were really like that, he would even believe him. After that, Zagan asked what he wanted. Barbaros smiled broadly and asked for access to the legacy of Marcosis, adding that Zagan manages it alone. Zagan gave a sharp negative answer and looked suspiciously at his interlocutor. Zagan asked why he should give him access to Marcosis, because he would hide from him everything that he considered useful. Barbaros frivolously agreed and asked in surprise what was wrong with that. Zagan wondered how Barbaros could be so smart and stupid at the same time. The hero said he would give Barbaros a couple of books and that was it. The drinking companion replied that it was also possible and noted what a generous friend he had. A huge man in armor entered the tavern, which confused the bar patrons. Barbaros rather clarified whether he would be able to choose his own books and asked his friend not to give him any garbage. After that, Zagan asked Barbaros what the knight who ate the dragon looked like. At this time, the man in armor began to gradually approach the magicians. Barbaros thoughtfully replied that he was a big old man with a big scar from his eyebrows to his left cheek. The man who entered the bar was Raphael. At that moment he had already approached the magicians. Zagan was able to successfully spot him in the reflection of his glass. Zagan said he thought he saw someone similar, which could be a coincidence. The hero's words amused Barbaros and he replied that he was very lucky, because if the knight had noticed him, he would have definitely stabbed him. Zagan hesitantly agreed with his words, after which a loud deep step sounded behind the magicians. Raphael was standing behind the magicians. Barbaros was greatly surprised by his appearance, unlike the calm Zagan. Barbaros got up from behind the counter in horror when he saw Raphael Hirandel. He asked the knight what he had forgotten in such a place. Zagan was calmly drinking his drink. Raphael was beside himself with joy. A maniac's smile was visible on his face. The expression on Raphael's face horrified Barbaros and the waitress behind him. Zagan calmly watched the night. Barbaros screamed, preparing to strike. The tavern patrons were terrified, and the waitress behind the counter fell to the floor in horror. Barbaros conjured a magic circle and prepared to strike the enemy with magic. 
Raphael was glad of the impending battle and reached for his sword with a terrifying grin on his face. No sooner had the opponents clashed in a fight, than Zagan calmly ordered the magician to stop and erase the magic of Barbaros, which led the latter to the highest degree of surprise. Barbaros was unhappy that Zagan had absorbed his magic. Zagan told Raphael that the place was not occupied and invited him to sit down with them. Raphael smiled and suggested that the new ruler was a sane person. Raphael proudly sat down at the table. Zagan carefully watched his new interlocutor. Zagan realized that he had decided not to complicate things and invite him to the table, but his goal here was just to have a drink. He didn't want to chat with this brute. At this time, Raphael started making a bunch of orders from the waitress. Zagan hoped that it would not be him who would chat with Raphael, but Barbaros and looked away. Behind the Zagan, Barbaros treats a fainted girl at the tearful request of her father. Barbaros was unhappy that he had to do this. The magician informed the girl's father that he was strong in healing magic, but he would try. The girl's father said that he did not expect anything less from Vladika Zagan's henchman. Barbaros replied with displeasure that he was not his henchman. Zagan looked enviously at Barbaros, he did not understand why to use magic, since she just lost consciousness. Raphael waited quietly. Zagan exhaled and asked his interlocutor what the dragon slayer wanted from him. At this time, Raphael began to receive drinks. The knight replied that he could just call him by his first name and added that he had heard about him from his colleague and decided to take a look for himself. Zagan mockingly asked if he lacked his own reflection. Raphael arrogantly replied that these words were said by a man whose evil grin is even rumored. Barbaros finished the girl's treatment, for which her father tearfully thanked the magician. Barbaros looked at the seated Raphael. Zagan said that he had heard about Raphael's hobby of killing magicians and asked what he would do since there were several of them here. Barbaros stood at the front door, thinking. The magician closed the door and slowly walked over to the table. Raphael and Zagan followed him with their eyes. Raffle replied that this was nonsense and he preferred prevention to treatment. Zagan relaxed, but Barbaros was still wary. The hero introduced Raphael to others. Raphael said that he had heard about the magician's battle with Shastel and asked him if she was a worthy opponent. Zagan replied that she was the strongest he had ever fought. After hearing Zagan's reply, Raphael summed up that she would be a threat to the church. Zagan didn't understand what he was talking about. Raphael said that she openly opposed the murder of the demon lord, and that was enough for the church to order her execution. His words surprised Zagan. He realized that she needed to do as the situation dictated, but she was being unnecessarily honest again. Zagan dejectedly leaned against the table and said that Shastel is extremely careless. He understands that such Leolai do not live long. Raphael agreed with his words. Raphael got up from the table and said that he had no more business with Zagan. The young man understood what he was trying to achieve. It immediately seemed strange to him that he did not show any aggression. This meant that he needed proof to kill Shastel. Zagan stopped Raphael at the exit. He said that she was loved in this city and some seemed to grieve for her. Zagan seriously stated that this was all his domain and if Raphael did something, he would wipe it off the face of the earth. Raphael arrogantly reminded that Zagan is the lord of demons. Zagan replied that that was why it hurt his pride. Raphael smiled and laughed out loud. The knight said that the magician is exactly what he imagined him to be. He added that Zagan is the evil that infuriates the church. The door is closed. The visitors looked nervously at the departed Raphael. Barbaros and Zagan stared at the doors in silence. Zagan told Barbaros that he didn't like Raphael to which he replied that it was natural for a magician. Barbaros invited his friend to catch up and kill him. Zagan said that it was possible to do just that. He told Barbaros to get down to business. The drinking companion grabbed Zagan by the cloak and was outraged that he wanted to send him to the slaughter. Barbaros angrily asked what Zagan wanted. Zagan jokingly replied that he wanted him to die soon and asked Barbarossa to keep an eye on Shastel. His words brought Barbaros back to normal. Barbaros asked why he was the one. Zagan asked if he didn't care. Barbaros bears the title Purgatory in Legends. This is the name of the place between heaven and hell. He is able to move freely through such a dimension. Zagan understood that this was teleportation and summoning. Barbaros' hobby. He could move to someone else's shadow only once he saw it. In direct comparison of strength, he was superior to Zagan. Barbaros asked if Zagan had decided to save the Holy Knight. Zagan replied that he would repay Barbaros later and hurried him on. Barbaros began to teleport and said that the hero would definitely regret it. When Barbaros left, Zagan realized that he had not paid for himself. Zagan may have invited him, but he also can't. After a while, Zagan returned home, where he was met by Nephi. 
The magician was surprised that the girl was still awake. Nephi reported that Fowl insisted that they wait while cleaning. Zagan noticed that Fall herself had fallen asleep in the meantime. Nephi reported that Fowl had told her that Zagan would be with her even after a thousand years, and she was glad to hear it. The young man stroked the Fowl on the head. He realized that there were dragons in the legends who lived for tens of thousands of years. It's probably not easy for them to find someone who will be with them all their lives, and therefore it's terrible for a little dragon to lose his parents. Nephi sadly said that she would also like them to always be together. Zagan did not understand what she was talking about, because he would be next to her. His words pleased the girl. Zagan quickly became close to Virgo, their gazes crossed. The young man realized that she had very long eyelashes and that she had recently taken a bath because her hair was wet and she smelled of soap. Nephi looked at the hero in surprise. Zagan put his hand on the girl's face and their lips began to gradually come closer. After that, the Barbaro's portal suddenly opened in the room, from which the magician shouted that they were having problems. The couple awkwardly moved away from each other. Barbaros is angry that Zagan did not answer him. Zagan angrily stood in front of Barbaros and ordered him to come over to make mince meat out of him. Barbaros didn't understand what he was angry about. The magician recalled with displeasure that Zagan himself had asked him to look after Shastel. He was holding the girl in his arms. This greatly surprised the young man and Nephi. They were discouraged by Shastel's condition. Barbaros said she was poisoned and the poison was most likely mixed into the drink. Zagan said he would get treatment as soon as possible and asked Nephi to help him. A fowl woke up due to an extraneous noise. The magician apologized and asked her to go back to sleep. Fowl noticed the holy sword of Shastel. She realized that Shastel was a holy knight. She activated her ability and rushed at the girl in anger. This greatly surprised Barbaros, who was holding her in his arms. Zagan stopped a foul shot. The girl was unhappy that he stopped her again. The magician replied that Shastel was his guest and she should not kill her just like that. Barbaros began to treat Shastel. The girl stood in anger. Zagan asked her how much she hated the Holy Knights. She replied that Zagan himself knows that she became a magician to take revenge on the Holy Knights. After all, the owner of this sword killed her father. Zagan said he understood the girl's feelings and assumed it wasn't her. He added that by killing her, she would not harm her opponents, but would simply create new ones who would take the path of revenge. Fowl angrily replied that this was a beginner's mistake and he couldn't know anything about it. Zagan stretched out his hand to the girl and said that this was not revenge. He added that revenge is when you make them suffer, when you drive them into such depths of despair and horror that they themselves beg you for death. His moralizing surprise Nephi and Fall. Zagan added that only then, Having enjoyed enough, she would kill them. Only killing would not be able to satisfy her. Fall asked uncertainly if Zagan had taken revenge on anyone. He answered positively, remembering about Andras and told the girl that he had failed. The young man added that therefore he would teach her how to take revenge correctly and she was lucky, because there are a lot of torture instruments here. After these words, the girls were even more surprised. Zagan came to his senses. Barbaros, who was holding Shastel in his arms, stood up and asked if it was okay to tell this to his adopted daughter. Shastel opened her eyes and was tired. She sat up in bed and touched herself. Zagan was reading a book and said casually that she had finally woken up. The girl jumped up on the bed when she saw the guy. He said to thank Nephi afterwards, because she was the one who dealt with the poison. Chasel asked again, and he asked her, didn't she remember? The girl understood everything. She received an invitation letter from an anonymous person. The girl asked in surprise, the Unity Faction. The man in the raincoat said that the task of the churches should be to contain the magicians, not to destroy them. The members of their group believed in it. The man offered to join them, because now that she had gone against the will of the church, she did not need protection. The girl thought that if he wanted to help her, then maybe it was a subordinate of Clavel. The unknown person said that it was not necessary to decide right now, but she should not delay with the answer. Also, as proof of their sincerity, she can say it in an hour of Nido Robas. The girl asked if that was his name. The man said that she might think so, but at the same time she didn't. For her, it was more like the name of the one who leads them. It will protect her in any situation, the man is gone, and the girl is left alone. She didn't know if she should have believed him. If she wants to survive, then her choice is meager, especially considering that Raphael was nearby. And yet, she had hardly known life other than chivalry, and now she had lost her home. She had nowhere to go back to. Even if she survived, she didn't know what to do next. The girl was drinking tea sitting at the table and suddenly she felt wrong and dropped the mug. Shastel went on to say that she returned to the church, drank tea and then collapsed. Zagan asked if she had any idea who might have poisoned her. 
She didn't even have a thought. She might have thought it was Mr. Raphael. The guy continued her words. This old man looked more like a fan of swinging a sword than trying to poison. The girl asked in surprise if he had met Mr. Raphael. He was preventing her from enjoying her vacation. The guy said that since she was Nephi's friend, they would help her, at least until she recovers. The girl asked in surprise. She tried to stop Zagan by grabbing his cloak. He wondered what she needed. She hesitated and asked him to stay for a while. Zagan told her to ask Nephi for such a thing. The girl became noticeably sad and sat down on the bed, apologizing. The guy stopped, and he sat down in a chair with his back to her. He said you can't wake Nephi up in the middle of the night, but he's just reading here. Shastel apologized again and didn't understand what she really wanted. She thought she just wanted him to look at her, but she immediately dismissed these thoughts. She wished Zagan and Nephi happiness and did not want to get between them. She probably just wanted to be a part of this picture where happiness was depicted. She was wondering what shape she would take if she got into this painting. Shastel was confused and did not understand what this form had to do with it. Nephi told the girl she was walking. Shastel recalled that she was the virgin of the holy sword and did not understand why she had to be a servant. Zagan told her to watch her mouth, because even he would not forgive her if he upset Nephi. The girl immediately began to justify herself and asked not to be so callous. A fowl appeared behind the fence. Shastel realized that this was Zagan's adopted daughter and tried to say that she was pleased to meet him. But the girl interrupted her, telling her not to talk to her, and called her horse-headed. Shastel didn't understand what she had done to her. Zagan said that her father was killed by the owner of the holy sword. It wasn't her fault, but the girl didn't care. He hoped the girl would understand. It seemed to Chesel that if she left it would be better. Zagan told her to just leave her alone for a while, because she's from a race of proud creatures, and this pride will not let her hurt the girl, as he thought. But a cry of anger rang out in the quiet castle. The guy was sitting on a chair and thinking about what would happen now. Shastel screamed because there was a frog in the house. Zagan laughed because it was the third time in an hour. The girl asked him not to laugh because he himself was talking about her pride. The guy thought that Valefer decided that she could make fun of her without using force. And the frog also croaked. After all, Fowl not only looked like a child, so it was quite expected. Chesel said he spoils her too much. The girl was his enemy, but he treated her differently. Zagan said that when they first met, he did something that made him feel guilty, and he didn't touch the girl. Shastel asked to hit her, but she did not like pain and was ready to endure for the sake of such an attitude. The guy narrowed his eyes and realized what her hobbies were. The girl shouted that this was not the case. Before she could finish, Fowl threw frogs at her, which made her scream again. Zagan thought that she was clumsy by nature. He didn't quite understand and asked if she was feeling better already. Chesel was inspired by this question, thinking that he was worried about her. He answered ambiguously. As time went on, there were more and more foul tricks. The girl was sitting with a bucket on her head, and the little girl was running away from the scene. It was forbidden to play pranks during meals. Therefore, Valefer sneaked into the bathroom when the girls were taking her and scared Shastel, and she swore at her, but the girl was unperturbed. The girls crying and screams echoed through the castle every day. After all this, maybe they can get along someday. Fowl was lying on the floor, turned around, thinking that dad was there, she called him, but he did not respond. Valefer saw her father's last fight. He was defeated, and the girl was scared. She was very angry at her father for leaving her. The girl exhaled, trying to catch her breath, grabbed the edge of her collar and left the room. Shastel was lying on the bed and she was dreaming of frogs, she was trying to get rid of them. Suddenly, Fowl raised her hand over the girl. Her hand was with claws, she was very angry. As a result, the girl patted Shastel's cheek. She was still asleep. Valefer was upset, because the girl was supposed to get angry and attack her, maybe even use a sword. Fowl walked away from the bed in frustration. Zagan was sitting on the throne, and Nephi was running towards him and shouting his name. The guy came down right away. The girl was trying to catch her breath. He asked her what had happened. As it turned out, the fowl was gone. The girl was standing in front of a huge castle. It was the castle of the demon lord. She thought maybe she could find the power here that would help her destroy the sword owners. She put her hand to the door and was silent. She liked being in Zagan's castle, liked the way he stroked her hair, and the way Nephi's arms hugged her tightly. And, even the horse-headed girl is a strange girl, but there is nothing to take revenge on her. But if she had stayed with them, she would have forgotten about her revenge. Is she really that worthless? She thought it was nonsense. She would never forget. She would not let this hatred die out. Didn't she see it with her own eyes? Her father flew away with the holy knights and did not return. 
and when she went in search of him, she found only a body with a pierced holy sword. With this, people repaid their father, who mentored them, who shared knowledge with them. She hit the door with her fist. The holy knights betrayed the wise dragon Orobas, and she had no right to forget that, ever. She remembered Zagan's words that in a thousand years she would learn to understand everything without words. Fall thanked Zagan and Nephi and apologized to them, because she can't stop. There was a man standing behind the girl. She turned around and saw him, realizing that she was being followed. It was Raphael, the girl was shocked. Falefa remembered him, and the man did not remember her. He did not remember that they were acquainted. The girl began to transform into a dragon, and Raphael immediately realized who she was. The man took out a sword. The girl did not have time to react, as he swung the sword. After all, the owner of the sword is not one of those, with whom it was worth fighting without preparation. The sword was approaching the girl, and she was only trying to pronounce Zagan's name. As the sound rang out, Zagan said maybe he said she could do whatever she wanted, but he didn't recall letting her stay up late. Raphael was annoyed that he agreed to stop his strike, because Zagan was the Lord of Demons. Fowl tried to find out why he followed her, but the guy interrupted her, saying that there was just a good courier nearby, and he delivered him to her. Barbaros said he was definitely not a good guy, and certainly not a courier. The girl shouted that this was not the case. After all, she betrayed him, but he came anyway. She didn't understand why he was doing this. Zagan said not to worry about the little things. Fall became noticeably sad. The girl's wings began to evaporate, she clung to the demon and cried. She started to apologize, and Zagan was glad that he had time. Nephi was wondering if everything was okay with the fowl, and Zagan told her that he would return as soon as he completed his business here. Also, he asked to wait for him at the castle. The girl agreed. The guy continued. He recalled that he had warned Raphael that if he did something wrong, he would wipe him off the face of the earth. The man was surprised because the front one was a Mac who was protecting someone other than himself. Zagan replied to him that it was someone but his daughter. Raphael was shocked and repeated the guy's words. He picked up the sword again, saying it was a pretty good reason. The guy confirmed and warned that he would disappear if he did not fight at full strength. Raphael didn't really want to do it, but he had to. After all, he definitely does not intend to disappear here. He began to address the holy ball to Metatron and asked him to hear his call. Zagan was surprised that Raphael used a pale white flame. His magic circle began to disappear. The guy was surprised that the circle was erased. It was a purifying flame and it is said that it burns out all evil and that the previous lords were defeated by it. This power was only available to the true owner of the sword. Barbaros was a little scared and turned to the guy, while he wondered why it was necessary to incite him. After all, he promised to teach him how to take revenge properly. It was necessary to crush the enemy at the peak of his strength. It was one of the ways to drive him into the depths of despair. Zagan followed his advice and ran closer to the enemy. His magic circle had almost disappeared. But suddenly Raphael was surprised and realized that the circle was not disappearing. Zagan said it's not the first time his circle has been destroyed. After all, using the legacy of Marchosis, he created a spell that can withstand holy swords. This circle absorbs streams of magic from the environment, so even the cleansing flame will not be able to destroy it instantly. Raphael was thrown away, and the guy continued to say that this shield is constantly getting stronger. He decided to call it the Heavenly Scales. The man was running out of strength and was thrown even further away. The corral continued that an ordinary person would have already had his hands crushed, but the man did not even drop his sword. Raphael struck out sharply. The guy managed to jump away, and a huge hole was left from the sword. Zagan continued to press Raphael with his seal. In an instant, they were thrown apart. The man was surprised, and Zagan realized that three strokes was the limit. It's still a long way from completion, but the result was excellent for the first attempt. Barbaros called the guy names because now was not the time to be in the clouds. Raphael swung his sword at the guy, who only reminded him of what he had already said. The corral dealt a crushing blow to Raphael, so that he flew off the wall, and he finished his sentence that he could afford to be in the clouds. Now that the cleansing flame had gone out, he could use his abilities again, for example, the magic that he had used on him. The foul clapped. It was quite pleasant for the guy to fight with him. But the man turned out to be too weak. He did not believe that this was the same Raphael who defeated a hundred magicians. There was another significant difference between mages and knights. Even one serious injury could be fatal for a knight, and he cannot become more. Raphael was trying to grab onto the wall, and the guy pointed at him and said that knights can't become just like him. But the man was able to stand up and pointed out the great power of the Zagan. 
and the guy was just surprised and didn't understand what he was. Nephi was sitting next to a black hole in the floor. Shastel came into the room and couldn't find Zagan. The girl replied that the gentleman had gone for a foul. Shastel was silent for a while and realized that she should follow, but immediately fell to her knees. She didn't understand what was going to happen next. After all, she is the one whom the church tried to eliminate, and she lived under the protection of a magician whom they hate. Everything was going too well, but she didn't understand why she needed this sword. Nephi asked if everything was okay with Shastel, and the girl replied that she would go to Nephi with her, and the girl replied that Mr. Zagan had asked her to wait here. Shastel didn't know if this was the right time to say such a thing, but she was a little jealous of Nephi. After all, she loves and is loved. Therefore, she is jealous that they have such a relationship. Nephi, in turn, envied her on the contrary, which surprised the girl very much. Shastel didn't understand what there was to be envious of, and the girl replied that she envied her because she could be with him, even at such a moment. Shastel was shocked by her words and said that she should not listen to his order and run after him. But Nephi couldn't do that. After all, she should be here when he returns to say welcome home, Zagan. She can't be with him right now, and she can't comfort him, she can't be his support. She hugged Shastel, which surprised her and made her cry. But she had no right to do that. After all, if anyone can cure his loneliness, it's her. After all, she is a holy knight. The girl raised her head and agreed. Shastel went on to say that it was all because she refused to fight. Nephi confirmed it again. The girl still did not understand why she needed this sword and for what purpose it was. She lowered her head, and then raised it and said that she did not want to defeat him. She doesn't want to fight him, shoulder to shoulder. Nephi sat and hugged her. She tried to calm her down. After all, she knew that when they first spoke, she realized that, and she understands how alone Zagan is. And she was a little jealous, because she thought she was the only one who could do it. But at the same time, she was happy. I am happy that there are others who understand him. She offered her hand to Shastel's cheek, and she realized that she had become stronger. After all, she helped Zagan overcome loneliness and even now she was able to calm her down. Nephi asked about her condition and whether she felt better after the consolations. The girl confirmed it, and she comforted her so much. Nephi agreed and thought she had done something wrong, but Shastel denied it. To the magicians, she was the enemy, and she didn't understand why she needed to be comforted. Nephi comforted her and said that weren't they friends to calm her down. The girl started crying again, and she was glad that she really thought that about her. Shastel thanked her and realized that she had to go. After all, she had nothing more to lose, and let this be the last choice, but she decided what to do, and she won't hesitate anymore. Nephi smiled happily and told her to be careful. Shastel immediately jumped into the black hole, fully prepared for battle. Zagan and Raphael stood in front of each other. The man was serious and had a wound on his stomach from which smoke was coming. The blow was fatal, but he is still on his feet. The guy realized that he had indeed acquired regeneration from the dragon. Zagan addressed the fowl, saying that he would not disappear just like that. In the meantime, she could come up with a punishment for him. The girl enthusiastically agreed and was glad about it. Raphael realized that he was definitely not liked here. The girl became serious, and she looked at him with the same look. She reminded him that the dragon he had destroyed was called Orabas the Wise. The man immediately became confused and realized that she was the child of Orabas and then he would have to destroy her. Zagan told him he wouldn't let him do it and immediately slammed him into the floor. Well, the man also jumped to his feet and jumped over the fence, so everyone was surprised. The guy immediately realized that he was not in front of him. Fowl summoned the magic circle and told him not to underestimate her. Zagan immediately shouted for her to stop, but Fowl had already launched an attack. She sent a magic circle towards Raphael, but he beat it off. Then a voice was heard telling them to back off. It was Chesel who turned to Mr. Raphael. Corral and Fowl were surprised. Barbaros realized that he had forgotten to remove the shadow. The guy saw that she was able to deflect both Raphael's blow and the foul magic at the same time. The girl did not understand what she was up to. Shastel said that at least Foul was tirelessly plotting against her, although she admits that it was her own fault that she invaded her life. But couldn't she have resolved everything peacefully? The girl was surprised, and Zagan told her that they should definitely talk, but first they had to deal with Raphael. He didn't understand what he wanted to achieve. He will not take pleasure in destroying someone who is literally begging for it. The girls were even more surprised. Fowl was wondering what he was talking about. The guy replied that he had figured it out himself, that's why he asked. His thirst for blood disappeared in an instant when he heard the name Orobas. Shastel immediately grabbed his cloak, sitting on her knees, and asked him to stop. She could only complicate things, she just needed to be quiet for a bit. 
and she meant something else. She said it was hard to believe, but it was him. He was the man in the raincoat who called himself Orobas. The guy was very surprised. He didn't understand what she was talking about. Strange sounds were coming from the door. Shastel turned to the guy, but he interrupted her because he knew what was going on. Something was coming. A stone monster appeared at their door and let out a very loud scream. Sagan realized that it was the aura of a demon. He denied it because he didn't feel the same horror as before, which means this golem was created in their likeness. It was the guardian of this castle, his seals broken by the presence of holy swords. Raphael didn't understand who it was. A mouth began to appear from the golem's head, which abruptly missed. He started growling again, and Zagan said that he was thirsty for blood and they needed to run. A light appeared from the golem's head, under which the fowl fell. Zagan noticed this and started shouting in her direction. Horror appeared on the guy's face. The smoke from the light began to disperse. Barbaros and Shastel didn't understand what was going on either, and the light absorbed the fowl. As it turned out, Raphael covered the little girl with his body and it was very painful for him. Zagan was gloomy. There was a stone statue behind him. He turned around and told her who she thought she was. The guy immediately used a magic circle and said he would grind her to powder. He summoned the celestial scales, which cut the golem in half. Immediately, Zagan ran to his daughter, fearing that something had happened. Fall replied that she was fine, but Raphael's wound was too close to his heart, and even with the dragon's regeneration, he could disappear. Raphael became sad, and said that she told him that he had killed Arabas. The foul was confirmed. The man said that she was wrong, because the great dragon was not weak enough to be hit by his hand. The girl thought that he was lying, because she saw everything herself and caught them off guard. He was eating it. The man decided to say again that Orabasa was not one of those who could be defeated by the betrayal of a common man. The girl did not understand what he was leading to. Raphael said that he had come that day to enlist the support of the great dragon Orabas in the battles, and he heeded his request. Foul asked again. The man confirmed it. He was going to form an alliance with the demons, as they were called in ancient stories. Everyone was surprised, and Fall asked not to talk nonsense, because this was the first time she had ever heard of such creatures. It might be hard for her to believe, he knew that. He also thought that they had left this world long ago, and yet one of them appeared again and destroyed not only the great dragon, but also many holy knights. And in the near future, others appeared. Fall looked at Zagan in surprise, but he confirmed it. He wasn't sure if they would come back, but they definitely existed. Therefore, he studies them and tries to figure out how they can be destroyed. The girl realized that her father had fought a demon and lost. Raphael said he didn't lose, he laid down his life to beat him. The foul turned into a scream, and she didn't understand who she hated. Raphael said that, let her be driven by hatred, but by pride, because Arabas gave his life to protect her in this world, and if she is not proud of him, then there will be no one. Raphael also said that if she needed to destroy him for this, then he would not resist. But she must remember that demons are powerful, and if they come back while the church and the magicians are feuding, then they won't have a chance. They should be ready. Therefore, even though it disgusted him, he drank the blood of Orabas in order to survive even at such a cost. Zagan asked that he was the envoy of the unity faction that Shastel was talking about. Raphael confirmed it. Barbaros thought that he didn't believe him, because hadn't he killed a hundred magicians with his own hands? and now he was offering peace. He didn't understand who would agree to such a thing. Raphael understood that perfectly well. Therefore, he could not be a representative of such a union, which means that Shastel should become one, because she was the captain of the Holy Knights, the Virgin of the Holy Ball, and the one associated with the Demon Lord. The seed of this union has already sprung, and if by doing so he can repay the debt to Orabas, then he does not need more. Shastel asked to wait for them a little bit, because it was difficult for her to digest it. Suddenly there was a sound from the side. Shastel and Zagan were surprised, it was the stone golem that began to resurrect. The guy realized how many immortals scurry around this world. He'll deal with them again. Shastel asked if he could destroy it, and he replied that he was not an expert on golems, but if it was created by magic, then he can certainly destroy it. But Raphael said it wasn't just a golem, and he was created by magic, weaving a golem with another creature with the ability to recover. Zagan guessed who it was, and Raphael immediately confirmed it. It was a chimera of a demon created by Marcosius. The guy realized that it would not be possible to simply destroy it. It was a stroke of luck. He couldn't believe that he would have to test another new trick. This chimera, he was sure, had been assembled from the remains of the demon that Raphael 
and Arabas had destroyed. This creature was insignificant compared to a real demon, and yet it possessed demonic power. Zagan cursed Marchosis because he had created an unpleasant creature. Well, that was all the better, because he just wanted to experience something. He would deal with her himself and told them all to stay away. Shastel asked to become his blade. They were standing back to back to each other, and the girl did not ask to completely trust the Holy Knight, but to allow him to help her in battle. The guy didn't think she had the guts to betray him. The girl did not understand if this was praise, or if he was laughing at her like that. But the guy didn't answer the same way. Raphael turned to Chiselle, but she immediately interrupted him, saying that she had not agreed to his proposal, but only that from now on it's up to her to decide what her sword will serve, and she won't hesitate anymore. She turned to the holy ball, Azrael, asking him to grant her his power. The sword shone, which surprised the guy and the girl stood proudly holding the sword in her hands. The guy realized that this fire is not at all like that unbridled flame of Raphael, because the light of the cleansing flame gently envelops the sword. The golem's mouth opened again, and Shastel immediately ran into battle. Zagan tried to stop her, because she didn't have consecrated armor, but she only repeated that she would become his blade. The girl deftly dissected the beam that was from the head of the golem. Everyone was surprised that the beam was diverging. The girl said that now it was his turn. Zagan smiled smugly, and I thought she was overconfident, but I ran ahead. The guy was next to the golem and swung to strike, but the golem opened his hand, so the guy was embarrassed. Black smoke began to surround the guy. Rocks were flying everywhere in different directions. He realized that the black smoke was the true form of this creature. Even if his stone body was destroyed, he would be able to reassemble. The girl shouted at him not to delay and immediately rushed into battle. The guy was surprised at how she crumbled the stones. Small pebbles were falling from the sky. He laughed and realized that if she had used it at their first meeting, he would have already disappeared. The guy immediately summoned a magic circle, and he told him to turn to ashes, and he also called for the heavenly flame. Zagan put a magic circle to his heart, but it didn't work. Shastel noticed this and realized that he had failed. The guy also confirmed it. The guy's fist remained unharmed and the golem took the form of black smoke. He said that he was already finished and the golem had crumbled into pieces. The girl did not understand what it was. Zagan only said that she had seen his heavenly scales spell. The sigil chooses the surrounding mana and serves as a shield infinitely strengthening itself, but he just used this mana in a different way. The girl asked in surprise. He made it so that by absorbing mana, it did not go to strengthen the sigil, but burn the chimera from the inside. Burning mana gives the flame a black color. The heavenly scales and the heavenly flame are two opposites born from the same idea. Magic against holy balls, magic against demons. But these abilities were still unreliable. He needed to work on efficiency, otherwise they would be useless against real demons. The girl noticed that he was indeed a terrifying magician. But Zagan praised the girl, saying that she did a good job too. Shastel was very surprised by his words, and he did not understand the reason for her surprise. The girl explained her surprise that he called her by her first name for the first time. The guy apologized. The girl was surprised again because he apologized. But he only said that she was Nephi's friend, and at least for that reason it was necessary to show her respect. The girl got a little angry. She had not come here for the sake of Nafi, but because she wanted to fight alongside him. The guy realized that she meant that the magician and the holy knight are together. The girl confirmed it. They looked at each other with a smile. Fowl called Zagan. She was sitting next to Raphael's body, and he said that he had seen the fastest blade in action in the hands of the holy knight. Zagan asked him to speak less, because he did not know how to use healing magic. He turned to the girl, saying that she could claim the opposite, but she was acting exactly as befits a representative of this union. His supporters will definitely give her the necessary support. Shastel realized that he had called himself Orabas out of fear that no one would trust him. The man confirmed it, and even before his disappearance, Orabas wished that he would survive and do everything possible for this union to be born. Therefore, his name is worthy to lead them. Zagan wondered why he had destroyed so many magicians. He had some kind of score to settle with them. But Raphael only said that he destroyed them because he wanted to, for some reason they attacked him themselves. Everyone was very surprised. He didn't know why, because he was trying to behave as delicately as possible. He even smiled, trying to show that he came in peace, but the magicians did not listen to him and immediately attacked. And if he is attacked, he fights back. And so it happened that many fell by his hand. Zagan was at a loss, because he had provoked them in the tavern, and he just wanted to warn about the danger that friendship with Shastel would entail. The girl immediately did not understand why. At their first meeting, he asked how many magicians she had defeated, and he replied again that if she had also destroyed many magicians, 
she would not be able to represent this union. Well, she replied that their number was not worth bragging about because he believed in her. Zagan clenched his fist. He was angry and wanted to know if he understood what he looked like. After all, he would definitely be mistaken for an enemy with his speeches and appearance. Baberos told Zagan to look at himself. Raphael asked Chisel to return to the church. He would deal with the man who was trying to get rid of her, and until then he simply had no right to disappear. She thought he knew who was behind it, and he thought that she had already guessed it herself. Raphael turned to Fowl and said that although he promised to give his life, he asked him to wait a little longer. The girl asked him to wait for him and answer what the dragon Orabas was for him. The man turned to her and thought about it. He replied that the dragon was great and would ride on his back and fight after him. It was the best time of his life. He hurried through the gate. Zagan asked his daughter if she was sure. She doubted that destroying him would be the right thing to do. The guy thought it might be for the best. He said it was time to go home because Nephi was waiting. The girl looked at him sadly and said okay. He didn't know if it was right to give up revenge either. She can warm up again, if there is a reason, and something can shake the determination of the fowl again. But even so, Nephi stood smiling, and welcoming Zagan, Fowl and Chastel. Everyone stood and smiled. He was at home. In a difficult moment, he and Nephi will be there for you. The castle of the knights. The leader said that meant they couldn't find out where Chastel had gone. The knights said that their search was in vain. There was no excuse for them. But the leader told them not to blame themselves severely. He was also responsible for her safety. He ordered the knights to rest. They obediently began to perform. The leader went and addressed Shastel. He did not understand why she could not just disappear for him. After all, magicians are evil, as are those who help them. And if the owner of the holy sword turned to evil, then the next one risks being tainted by it and being unable to bring justice. If it hadn't been for the tenacity of the other cardinals, he would have executed her long ago. He couldn't have fought, because as soon as she got the sword, she immediately disappeared. He didn't understand if the poison hadn't worked on her. First there was the knight, unable to unleash the power of the sword. Then the one who constantly contradicted him. And now she's the one who doesn't want to fight the demon lords. He did not understand why this sword only chooses those who are not worthy of it. But if Shastel disappears, then the sword will be able to choose a new, innocent owner. And this time he will succeed. He will be able to nurture someone who will become the very embodiment of justice. Raphael announced that he was back. Clavel turned and saw Raphael. He also saw the wound and did not understand what had happened to him. The man said that there was no need to worry about her, he came to complete something. The cardinal thought he needed help, but it was luck for him. He didn't know what happened to him, but he is also struck by evil. He didn't fully understand what he was trying to achieve. But in any case, his disappearance would only strengthen his influence in the church. The cardinal was still trying to offer help. Raphael swung his sword, and the cardinal lost his arm. He said that, unfortunately, he had no desire to apply compresses of poison. The cardinal screamed loudly and fell on his back. The knight told him not to make so much noise. It was the first time he had decided to destroy someone himself, so he was a little nervous. They were already old men and they should not have interfered with the younger generation, much less tried to cut them down starting at the root. The cardinal shouted for help and did not understand where everyone had gone, because the knights had just been here. He did not understand why he, the messenger of God, was threatened by someone who was tainted with evil. Raphael did not understand why he made such a sad grimace, because he would disappear from the sword he was possessed by. He should be more cheerful. The man said that he would follow him soon, and that they would see each other in hell. Chesel was sitting on the couch and realized that Cardinal Clavel was behind everything. Nephi was surprised that she knew about it, and the girl explained that he strongly believed that it was the church that should bring justice. Zagan did not understand this, because among those who believe in such things, there is not a single decent person. Chesel smiled at the fact that he was as straightforward as usual. She also thought that the church was moving in the wrong direction. She was not so self-confident to talk about reforming it, but she would like to change it a little. Therefore, the girl decided to return there. Zagan understood everything and thought about it. He abruptly raised his finger in the direction of Shastel and said that the tea was poisoned. The girl was scared, and he immediately said that it was a joke, but if she starts to doubt people at least a little, then it will definitely happen again. Shastel leaned on the table and shouted that he was not ashamed at all, because she could have spilled the tea that Nephi had brewed and Zagan said that she did not cook it. Fall was sitting behind the sofa smiling. The girl noticed her and was a little embarrassed. She decided to approach her. She was sorry that they never had a chance to have a quiet chat. The girl pulled Valleyfer to her head, but she moved away. Shastel smiled and said goodbye to everyone. To her surprise, Fowl told her to come back. 
The girl turned around in tears because she called her by name for the first time. Fall only noticed that she was crying again. Although she did not stay long, Shay still thanked them for everything. She did not know what would come out of the idea with the Unity faction, but she would do her best to make life easier for all of them. She was sure that Raphael would have wanted it too. The man said it was an excellent speech and put his hand on Shaystal's shoulder. After all, she has gathered her will into a fist, but if something bothers her, she must certainly apply. The girl enthusiastically agreed and turned to him in surprise. She screamed in fear. Zagan only asked Raphael if he could get up. The man confirmed it because he was under the protection of Orabas. And with her in the elven charms, this wound is nothing. But it won't grow a hand, of course. Shastel screamed in surprise against the background. She did not understand why they were chatting as if nothing had happened. Zagan did not understand what had happened. The girl replied that she thought Mr. Raphael had disappeared. And the guy just said that he was the one who told him that he was done with Clavel. He destroyed it. And he made the tea. The girl was even more surprised at all the words, but she was glad that he was alive. Raphael said that she was too naive, because she would not get regret from someone who would stab her in the back. Zagan explained that it is dangerous to trust those whose true intentions are unknown to her. They might betray her. Raphael confirmed by saying, My lord, and Chesel said that she immediately caught the gist. It's just that she understood how the man addressed Zagan. The man thought he had said that Mr. Zagan had taken him in as a butler, and therefore, starting today, he is resigning his powers as captain of the Holy Knights. The girl screamed even harder. The next morning after returning to the castle, he felt through the barrier that an exhausted Raphael was standing in front of the entrance. The man said he had returned as promised, and now he could take his life. Zagan said that it was a foul to decide. She paused, clenched her fist and said that he should devote his life to Zagan and Nephi, that was her wish. That's how Raphael began to work in the castle. Having a holy ball and its owner at hand significantly accelerated his research. And not to say that anyone else was eager to work here. If he hadn't met Nephi, then everything was like this, he would have been merciless. Fowl wondered if it wasn't difficult to do everything with one hand. But Raphael said it wasn't worth worrying about. The girl thought about it and made his arm out of armor. She had a magic circle in her hands. She used this armor while living under the guise of Valafer. Fowl asked me to move my hand, and Raphael's hand moved. He could not have imagined that he was now in debt not only to Arabas, but also to his daughter. Now his life is in her hands. The girl just asked not to exaggerate. Shastel realized that she was the only one leaving. The three of them confirmed it. The girl was scared, but Zagan said that she could come back at any time, because Nephi and Fall would be glad to see her. She asked about herself, and Zagan confirmed it. Shastel asked about Zagan. He was surprised and began to think that sometimes it's nice to sit and have a drink together. The girl was visibly delighted and ran to the church. Zagan noticed that she made so much noise. Nephi turned away, and Zagan did not understand why she was angry. But the girl didn't seem to be angry. The guy, that's why he asked her. He held out his hand to her. The girl asked him to guess for himself. Zagan realized that she was angry and at the same time waiting for something. He was embarrassed and reached out his hand to her head. The guy put his hand to his cheek and apologized for leaving it yesterday. Surprise appeared in the girl's eyes. And I told him it wasn't fair. The couple in love stood apart from Raphael and Fall. Meanwhile, the man closed the girl's eyes so that she could not see anything. He told her that it was because it was too early for her to see it. Nephi gripped Zagan's arm tightly. Someone was watching them through a magic ball. The unknown person told her to laugh as long as she could. Nephilia is cursed. It was morning outside, and Nephi and Fall were walking through the city. The girl asked for sweets. There were touts on all sides who advertised their stores. The girl refused the fowl, saying that dinner was coming soon. The merchant said that if they want to bake chicken, he advises these herbs. The woman said to thank the Lord on their behalf. Nephi thanked the merchant for the herbs. Well, I wanted to eat. She was looking forward to dinner soon. She felt it too and decided that they would go home. The girl turned around and rushed at Nephi because something had happened. Something fell nearby. Fowl realized that they were being attacked, and it was some kind of spell. A woman's foot stepped onto the road. A voice came from under the cloak, wanting to make sure it was Nephilia. The girl got angry. The unknown man in the raincoat saw no need to doubt. She began to cast a spell that Nephi had disappeared. The girl was shocked, but Fowl tried to save her with a magic circle, and Nephi was already trying to stop the Fowl. Spears started flying from everywhere, they hit people, and there were screams everywhere. Even ordinary people were offended, and Nephi screamed at her to stop. The fragments stopped, and the girl in the raincoat was surprised. Nephi stood up proudly. More spears flew, but the girl stopped them. Fall realized that Na-Nephi had taken control of them, 
and I realized what kind of power she has. The girl in the raincoat felt sick. Nephi said that she would not leave and sent spears in her direction, but the unknown had a strong shield that split anyway. But the girl did not give up and sent more and more fragments, which Nephi sent back. The unknown woman said that the girl was worthless, but she was still an elf. The girls were surprised by the stranger's words. As it turned out, the girl in the cloak was also an elf. Fall didn't understand why her face looked so much like Nephi's. The girl said that the sigil of the Lord was a terrifying force. There was a magic circle on the floor. Voices rang out. The people lying on the path did not understand what had happened. It was Zagan's barrier. Nephi was trying to stop the girl and trying to figure out who she was. The girl replied that she was Nephi, only cursed. The girl disappeared, leaving a note behind her. The merchant turned to Nephilia. He was afraid that something had happened to her. Others looked at everything and thought that Nephi had restored it. The girls noticed the letter. It was written to the demon lord Zagan from the demon lord Bifrons. Raphael summoned Metatron by drawing his sword. He pointed the sword at Zagan, who activated the magic circle. He realized that the power was not in the blade itself, but in the writing on it. They were so different from magic symbols that he didn't even know where to start working on them. It seemed to him that he was tapping on the sword with a hammer, making notches that were immediately sealed. And it seemed to him that the blade was like a living being. Raphael thought it was close to the truth. And he also realized that Zagan had not yet revealed the secret of the holy swords. The guy replied that thanks to the books left by Marchosis, he knew where these symbols came from. It was a divine language. The symbols coincided with those used by the ancient deities, but with the departure of these creatures from their world, the meaning of these characters was lost, and even the church cannot read them. Raphael said that the sword chooses its owner, and sometimes it seems to show its will. In addition, this manifestation takes shape depending on the owner, such as the flame of Raphael and the flame of Chastel. But if the swords really had their own will, did that mean that their creators were made of living beings? But in this case, there should have been traces of their creators. And if so, it is better to work in this direction than to explore the swords themselves. Zagorani had two goals, the first to learn how to destroy demons, the second to find a way to destroy the seal of the demon lord. He promised Nephi a quiet life, and the demons, and the lords themselves, would certainly give them trouble. If he doesn't find a way to destroy the seals, then he won't be able to get rid of their owners either. He thought he could find out why the symbols of the seal and the writing on the blades were so similar, that he can get to the bottom of it, but suddenly Zagan was scared. Raphael didn't understand what had happened. The guy explained that the barrier in cyanide had worked, and something happened next to Nephi and Fowl. Zagan immediately ran to the exit, and the girls were already standing there. The guy was very worried. Fall wanted to tell her, but Nephi squeezed her hand. The girl became noticeably sad, and so did the fowl. She explained that nothing terrible had happened. Zagan and Raphael exchanged glances. The guy asked his daughter again, she confirmed it. Zagan calmed down and said that Raphael was just about to squeeze the juice, and he asked the girl to help him. They're gone. Zagan and Nephi were left alone. No one could hear them. Nephi began to apologize. The guy thought it was so hard for her to talk about it. He was ready to destroy whoever did this to Nephi. But if she couldn't talk about it, then she needed to calm her down and not bring up the subject until she was ready to tell everything herself. He did not understand how he could do this, because when he is not in the mood, she puts her head on his lap. He tried to calm himself down and thought about how to behave in such a situation. The girl tried to explain herself, but Zagan had an idea to take her to a place where there would be a suitable atmosphere. The guy picked her up, the girl was shocked. He carried her and thought she was so light, so soft and smelled so good. They were both confused. Zagan brought her to the library because it's a cozy and pleasant environment. She couldn't be put on her knees here, so he just sat down at the table with her. She didn't understand what he was doing, and he didn't know either because dinner wasn't coming soon and he wanted to finish reading something. He realized that he had miscalculated badly somewhere. Mephi remembered the letter. She gave it to Zagan, saying that she had been given something when she was in Kyanet. He asked me to read it out. In the letter, the highly esteemed Lord of Demons Zagan, in order to strengthen the relationship, he invites him to an evening ball. The invitation extended to all the inhabitants of the castle. She is looking forward to his consent. The demon Lord Bifrons. Zagan thought that he dared to raise his hand against Nephi, because they know about Shastel, and even that foul lives with them, which means they have been watched for some time. The girl thought that he would agree. He replied that he had received a personal invitation from the bishop. He had no reason to refuse. In any case, you will have to face him. And this was a good opportunity to compare their strengths. The girl looked sad. 
He remembered that she had been through something terrible, so it all scared her, but he did not understand how to calm her down. Suddenly he remembered that Nephi often hugs Fowl, and decided to do the same. The girl was very shocked by what was happening. Zagan realized it was a bad idea, and besides, she was banging his ear. The guy cleared his throat awkwardly. He didn't care if it was the Lord or someone else. If he dared to upset her, then he was not going to sit idly by, but would give him a good beating. The girl realized that he had guessed everything. Zagan confirmed, but admitted that he had not guessed everything. He only saw that she was depressed. Nephi apologized again and said she wasn't ready to talk about it. Zagan understood everything and told her to tell when she wanted to. The girl exhaled and thanked him, she felt much calmer. She asked me to put it down because it was embarrassing. But he refused, because there was still time before dinner and he wants to read. The girl was even more confused. Suddenly she noticed the sword and wailed the inscription on it. She assumed that Metatron was the name of the blade. The guy looked at her sharply and realized that she could read these symbols. The girl confirmed it. She didn't understand the meaning of the written word, but she knew how to read it. Zagan realized that this language had something to do with the elves or with another race that had come into contact with them. This could lead them to important discoveries. Barbaros was holding macaroni in his hands and was surprised that Zagan was invited to the evening ball of the Lord. It seemed to him that the whole story smelled bad. He asked him to listen and gave 80-90% that it was a trap. Zagan said that 80 is too little, there is a 100% trap there. Barbaros was embarrassed. Fall, who was sitting in his arms, turned to the guy. She said his henchman wasn't too smart and there was no need to be so rude to him. The guy realized this and apologized. Barbaros viciously told them to stop making fun of him. Fowl said he was a worthless magician who came here for treats, which meant he shouldn't be defiant. And if we talk about age, she was three times older than him. Barbaros was angry and didn't understand who she thought she was. Zagan asked to watch his language. He could destroy him for calling his daughter names. He also wondered why he had come. Barbaros grinned and said that yesterday an elf in Kyanid was attacked by a magician, so he thought he would want to know something. Zagan was all ears, and if the information turned out to be useful, he would let him choose a reward. Barbaros was lured by this offer, but he was stopped by a fowl with a magic circle. Zagan understood that she didn't like his face, but that was no reason to destroy it. Meanwhile, Barbaros did not understand what was wrong with his face. Seeing as she didn't want him to hear about yesterday again, Nephi sat tensed. Zagan patted Fowl on the head and said he would wait until Nephi told him herself and asked her not to be angry. Valafer was surprised that he had read her mind, and Zagan apologized to Barbaros because this time he wanted to do without his story. He asked him again, and if he would definitely not regret if he did not take the situation seriously. But Zagan didn't care, Barbaros tried to continue anyway, but then the fowl broke down, saying that his henchman's tongue had loosened and he had to be destroyed. Barbaros swore at the girl, thinking that she did not value human life. After such an altercation, they sat in silence. Zagan was eating pasta and said that today the sweets were tastier than usual. Fall said that Nephi was in a good mood in the morning and did not understand what he had done to her. The girl blushed. She couldn't find a place for herself under the gaze of her master. Zagan thought it was cute, because he thought he made a lot of mistakes yesterday. He thought he could cheer her up. Valafer said it was time to free Zagan's knees for Nephi, but she wasn't exactly eager to sit on them. Zagan looked at her and offered her a seat. This confused the girl even more. She was about to get up, saying it was mean. But she saw a strange look from Barbaros and sat back down. The guy thought that she would have sat down if not for Barbaros and wished that he had already left. Zagan announced that it was time to get ready for the ball. Barbaros looked at him in surprise and thought that he had decided to dress up for the ball. But the guy reminded me that Shastel was mentioned in the invitation. Even if she forgot about it, she could still be dragged into this story and it would be better for her to know in advance. Barbaros remembered about the girl and did not understand how much more he had to look after her. A whole month has passed, and Barbaros is still protecting her. Zagan realized that they had not discussed how long he would have to do this. He thought about it and said he didn't remember him mentioning the deadline. Barbaros thought the guy was generous, but it turned out to be a complete divorce, and I didn't understand why she was called at all. Zagan replied that everyone connected with him had been invited. He was surprised and delighted, because it meant that he was invited too. But his happiness was immediately cut short by Zagan's words that he was not invited. Barbaros immediately hung on to him and did not understand why he was not invited. But the guy didn't know and he didn't care. Barbaros was upset, but Zagan just said that he was giving me a headache. But suddenly the sad guy realized something. 
the castle would be empty in the absence of everyone living in it, and he could look after it. After all, it was very imprudent, and otherwise the castle would have been under supervision. Fowl still offered to destroy him, but Zagan supported his idea. Arbaros was immediately delighted, saying that he was being pampered too much. Fall said that he would surround the whole castle, and Barbaros said that Zagan would decide for himself, but he said that if someone else tries to take something out of the castle, then he will be punished with dignity. Barbaros began to swear, because he almost said goodbye to his life when he tried to take out the grimoire. He was attacked by the demonic dogs of the void. Zagan was surprised that he was still alive, but he did not understand why this disappointed him. Fall and Zagan exchanged glances, and the guy told her not to worry. He made sure that she didn't work on her and Raphael. The girl praised him, but he only said that these were the most common measures. Barbaros said it was nothing like that. Even magic, which can distinguish him from someone else, is already difficult to learn, and most magicians won't even waste time on it. Zagan wouldn't be able to call himself the Demon Lord even if he couldn't do such a spell, and there's no way he's going to let his own magic hurt Nephi. Barbaros understood everything and decided to say something last. He was not sure that it was right to keep silent about yesterday. The girl nodded, and the magician laughed, realizing that he had wasted his time. It seemed stupid to him. He waved his hand and disappeared. Nephi said that Mr. Barbaros was kind in his own way, too. Zagan was surprised, because she had heard that they were discussing his destruction. The girl thought they were friends, but the guy didn't consider him a friend. And again I remembered about the ball at the Demon Lords. He was wondering what they had prepared for him. Nephi wondered who that girl was. She had white hair like all the damn kids like her. Their faces were similar too, but her eyes were full of hate. The angel thought that something was wrong, but Nephi said she was just thinking about something. The girl thought that she was talking about a magician who destroyed everything around and was not like her. Her face gave her away a lot. The girl thought it was an old acquaintance of hers, but it was not so. Nephi had a bad feeling about her. She was afraid of her incredible strength, and the words she uttered were threatening. They are not similar in structure to magic, but rather to witchcraft. But it wasn't just that, she understood their meaning. Only because he was able to gain control of her spell, and use it. But after their meeting, she felt that something had started to change in her. She didn't want to become like her. If one day she hates something with her whole soul and with her strength she will be able to destroy people without shame. If she became like this, whether Zagan would love her, the girl only cared about that. She immediately dismissed these thoughts, because of course he would be there. If she clings to him, she's sure he won't leave her. And yet it was wrong. The angel girl said that she would never become the same. But if something bothers her, then she should definitely come to her. Because her sister will cheer her up in the blink of an eye. But if you put other people's problems on their shoulders, then Nephi will hate himself. She is next to Zagan because she wants to be his support but she cannot cling to him like a parasite. The girl was surprised and asked her to listen. After all, it meant not clinging, but relying on another person. Nephi asked again, and the girl gave her an example. If she noticed that Zagan was oppressed by something, as she is now, then what would she do? She said that if that happened, she would try to lighten his burden and support him. That's exactly what the girl had told her. It won't burden her, and she won't hate him. Nephi said the word rely again. In her homeland, she has always been alone, an outcast. She has already forgotten what it means to rely on others. After all, as long as she does not stand still and moves forward with him, she will not be some kind of parasite and will not just cling to him. The girl added that sometimes it's very sad when no one even counts on you. Nephi became serious and thanked Manuela. She also decided that she needed to have a proper conversation with Mr. Zagan. Manuela was inspired, but if she suddenly decides to cry, then she is always glad to see her. She has so many tips on underwear. Nephi smiled and thanked him, but declined. And then, the largest lake S. Fragida. Fall was very impressed with its size. She saw the ship for the first time and realized how much it was rocking. The girl had a lot of fun. Zagan asked her if she liked their trip, and she agreed. Fall drew Zagan's attention to Nephi's beautiful dress and waited for his opinion. He blushed and the dress was as beautiful as she was. Nephi was very embarrassed. She looked very worried about something when she went to get a dress. But it looks like everything is fine now. Zagan asked Raphael how the armor, Veilfar, fits, he thought it could squeeze. But the man replied that, on the contrary, it was much more practical than his consecrated armor. Raphael's face was too well known among the magicians. So they clothed him in an old foul armor. The creation of consecrated armor is a secret that is jealously guarded even inside the church. Raphael was surprised that he was able to transform the ghostly armor into her. 
and the guy just replied that it was entirely the merit of Nephilia, because his consecrated armor, like the holy swords, uses symbols, and their source of power is most likely the heavenly language. But at the same time, Nephi was able to read them. So it occurred to him that if they repeated the symbols from the consecrated armor, then their power would manifest along with them. Raphael was very surprised by this, and Nephi said that they were different from the language spoken in her village. But she had definitely seen them somewhere before. But she could only read them. Zagan said that when he tried to fill the symbols with magic, it didn't work. Perhaps there was some reason why only someone who can read these symbols can use them. And surely an elf or someone from a race close to them is working with the church. He must have invented the consecrated armor. Raphael thought that she could make holy swords, but she denied it. They managed to reproduce their power, but only partially. They were copies that couldn't even compare to the originals. And apparently, certain conditions were also necessary for their creation. Otherwise, the church would have put their production on stream long ago. In addition, the symbols on the seal of the Lord, although similar to the heavenly language, but Nephi could not read them. There is still some kind of connection between them, but they have achieved certain results. Zagan hoped that in the future he would also be able to count on his support. Raphael cheerfully supported me. Suddenly, Shastel appeared, apologizing for interrupting them. It seemed to her that the ball was not taking place here. But Zagan confirmed that this is the place. At the time, she didn't understand why such creepy music was playing and he replied that many guests did not want their conversation to reach other people's ears. The host of the ball understood this and is trying for them. Then Shastel noticed that the musicians themselves were not alive, and Zagan replied that they were probably Bifron's henchmen, and the siren was invited to the performance, and she had a good voice. The girl was already upset, because he had sent her an invitation to the ball, but he did not know what kind of meeting it was, and he replied that it was a trade meeting for magicians. Shastel had already screamed because she didn't understand why he hadn't warned her in advance. It seemed to her that the evening ball should look like a normal party, and she dressed with this in mind. Nephi said that the dress she was wearing really suits Shastel, and the girl in response praised Nephi's dress, but it wasn't about that. Zagan did not want to believe that she had come here unarmed. Shastel said her sword was left in the lobby. She didn't think it would be okay to dance in the armor of a holy knight. Everyone present turned sharply in their direction. The cloaked mages started talking about what she had mentioned about knights. One of them remembered that she was the only woman among the captains of the order. Someone thought that she had been sent to a soiree to the bishop. Someone thought it was an impertinence. Someone suggested destroying it altogether. Shastel began to feel very uncomfortable. Zagan still understood that they were causing a lot of problems, and he told me to follow him. They were walking through the hall with a large number of guests. Shastel didn't understand why he was walking through the crowd, and Zagan wanted to create an impression. The song March of the Demon Lord started playing, but everyone was looking at Zagan, realizing that it was him. They thought he was the new Dragon Lord. Someone noticed that the ghostly one was following him. There was a rumor that he had disappeared, which meant that Zagan had subdued him. They also noticed the horns on the fowl and realized that it was a young dragon. Someone heard that Zagan got it when he killed the mage hunter Raphael. Next, a white-haired elf entered their conversation. Someone warned that this is Zagan's bride and you need to be careful with her. Someone else heard that purgatory was cut into eight pieces in an attempt to harm her. Someone must have been talking about the seven-day torture he was subjected to. I heard that he was able to survive only by swearing allegiance to Zagan. They thought that since he was able to gather such a pack, it meant that he had subdued the Virgin of the Holy Sword. But Shastel wanted to intervene because she didn't remember her becoming his henchman. Zagan told her that if people say that, then it's true. And if not, they will destroy it. The girl immediately jumped up to him. People whispered and said that she really looked like a virgin and assumed that she was his concubine. Chasel was about to object when Fowl told her to keep quiet by hitting her on the back of her dress. The whole pack went up to the bridge. Shastel held on tightly to Zagan, who asked her to get off him. But the girl said that he misunderstood her because she couldn't open her arms. Nephi offered her her help. Shastel immediately started apologizing to her. She was in complete shock. Zagan blushed, as did Nephi. After all, he had never seen her like this before and was even glad. And now, Zagan went out over the bridge fence and into the crowd. He started making a speech. He thought they had heard all about him and introduced himself once again. And he was the new demon lord. He also mentioned the host of the evening who had not yet appeared, but Zagan wanted them to have a lot of fun. All the people with glasses raised them up as a sign of respect. 
Zagan doubted that there would be a fool here who would risk angering him, so if Shastel was careful, she would be safe. She thought he was hinting that she was clumsy. Zagan knew that she understood this perfectly well herself. Nephi offered to talk to her, and she calmed down. Chesel thanked her because she is always kind to her, but in the same second, Fowl shamed her for being a crybaby. Shastel asked Nephi if she had any cases when she was on the ship. But the girl told her that this was the first time for her because she grew up in the mountains. Zagan intervened in their conversation, saying that this had technically happened. As a boy, he was trying to get food and fell into a box, and someone boarded him up and took him to the ship. He had food, of course, but he almost suffocated. And when he was discovered, he was thoroughly scolded. Nephi supported the conversation by saying that she somehow climbed into the basement and found some honey there. But she was locked up and she almost froze there. Zagan immediately asked her if she could identify those who had done it. And if they have already disappeared, then they will resurrect them and make them suffer the same way. Nephi thanked him, but she didn't think it was worth resurrecting someone for revenge. The girl said that Zagan himself did not take revenge on those who scolded him, and he replied that the stolen fruits were still very tasty. The girl confirmed, remembering that the honey was also delicious. Fowl realized that the two of them had to go through a lot. But Shastel was more worried about the church leading its flock in the right direction. Zagan remembered that incident and became interested in the development of the church after it. The girl explained that Cardinal Clavel's disappearance had been declared an accident a month ago. Those three knights tried to cover up all traces, but the Unity faction already knew that Raphael was looking for a meeting with the Cardinal, so they most likely guessed everything. But there were no questions on their part, they didn't even ask her for anything. Raphael said that the main goal of the Unity faction is to avoid unnecessary conflicts with magicians. In other words, his actions correspond to their aspirations, but they didn't know when the demons would return. They will deal with this when Mr. Zagan becomes even stronger. The guy realized that they were fine with everything as long as she got along with him. Shastel was surprised that he was bothered by this. Zagan replied that if someone was poisoned and destroyed in front of him, even he would be worried. The girl thought he was worried about her, and the guy thought that he had made a mistake with the answer, and he explained that he meant that he did not want her to disappear because he was his friend, but she thought about love. The girl misunderstood him, and now he did not know what to say to him. But he didn't care, he didn't care what was on other people's minds, as long as it didn't bother him and Nephi. And Shastel is not stupid enough not to feel the difference. But he thought she wanted to hide it herself. Then the girl asked Zagan about his specific purpose. She repeated that she wasn't weak enough to be a burden, so she wanted him to be able to trust her. Zagan and Nephi were surprised by her words. After all, he had already saved her more than once, and she wanted to repay him. She didn't care if it was in the form of an alliance or something else, but she wanted to keep this relationship going. He was not sure that he understood what trust was, he had not felt it for a long time. The girl was surprised to think that they completely trusted each other with Nephi. And maybe he doesn't realize it himself, but he trusts Nephi and relies on her. Zagan realized that it sounded like the truth. After all, it was thanks to her that he understood what it means to heal someone else's heart. But not only her, didn't he trust Raphael and Fowl? But he doubted that the day would come when he could rely on Chastel. Nephi thought about it and rubbed the collar of her dress. She turned to Zagan, saying that she needed to tell him something. Everyone turned back, there were boxes in the back and knocking was coming out of them. Fall was trying to figure out what was there, and Shastel thought it was a stowaway. Immediately, they remembered a story they had recently told from Zagan, and everyone immediately had lunch to open the drawer, because suddenly a street kid fell in there. Raphael suggested that there might be a dangerous beast there and asked to be allowed to open it. When they opened the box, they were surprised. There was a boy who thought he was going to suffocate. He thanked them very much, because he would never have opened it himself, he decided that now he owes them for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, Zagan wanted to know what Shastel wanted to talk to him about, and she, in turn, said that it was not so important now. The guy got angry and looked at the boy, because he appeared right when Nephi wanted to tell him something. The boy was very apologetic, he didn't want to interrupt their conversation. The boy introduced himself, his name is Nero and he is a novice magician, so he could have dealt with the scratch himself, but then his magic circle flared up. Raphael asked if the boy was alright, and he just wanted to show off and in fact he didn't have any abilities, even after a year of training, he still couldn't learn magic. His eyes lit up, and on his knees he began to ask the Lord to take him as a disciple. After all, that's why he got on board. The guy stood in amazement. But the boy continued that he understood how very brazen it was on his part, but he continued to ask. He could only ask for it. But Zagan didn't feel even a drop of magic power from him. 
he understood everything and said that he was not up to the students right now. The boy began to run around him offering his services. The girl looked at the boy who was begging, and someone hovered over her ear, laughing and saying that she had a kind heart. She immediately turned around, and the magician took off, instructing her not to trust magicians. After all, they are all liars. This was the temptress Gamori. She wanted to personally greet the lord. The guy realized that she was one of the candidates. Zagan thought that she needed something from his daughter. But Gamori replied that she was trying to figure out whether the wonderful butterflies that surrounded the lord had been stolen or not. The woman realized that it looked like she was worried for nothing. The guy said that if she wanted to take care, then she better take care of Shastel, and she started screaming at him not to turn her in. The woman expressed that she does not like holy knights and does not care what happens to her. Someone appeared behind Gamori's back and said that it was indecent to say such a thing. A man with a lion's head was standing there. Zagan realized that it was a werewolf lion and he had seen it at the auction. It was the black blade of Kamaris. He picked up Gamori by the cloak and apologized to Zagan, because this lady's mouth exuded poison, but her heart is kind. After all, when she saw children from rare races like elves and dragons next to him, she became worried that they had suffered a terrible fate. Kamaris asked to forgive her. The woman asked to be released because she had not said anything to ask for forgiveness. Zagan thought the two of them knew each other. The werewolf confirmed it. And maybe he looks intimidating, but he's a coward at heart, so he relies a lot on Mrs. Gamori. They began to imagine how an old woman was dragging a werewolf. The woman said that she just loves animals, and why else would she help him? It seemed to Kamaris that now was not the best time to confess. The woman asked again. Zagan was surprised that they were candidates for the place of the Lord, and if they were elected, the world would be safer. The werewolf asked the guy to be careful, because it seemed to him that he was kind. He was sure that there would be those who would want to take advantage of it. The lion looked at the trembling boy. Zagan replied that he was kind, not the best word to describe the demon lord, and Kamaris explained that kindness is often called the ability to feel sympathy and I thought that he felt this way about his followers. Zagan was shocked by the fact that the werewolf was not at all shy about what he was saying, besides being so honest. But the guy thanked the werewolf for the warning. Kamaris hurried away. Shastel was amazed that there were other good magicians besides Zagan, and it seemed to the guy that he showed up only to protect Gamori. He thought that since magicians couldn't live a normal life, they all ended up rotting from the inside, just like himself. But it seems that some did not discard their humanity. Damn Nephi was sitting on the mast, watching everyone. It's time to start the show. Zagan conjured a chair, saying that since they were done with all the hassle, then Nephi should sit down. The girl said it would be better if she stood. Then he pointed at Shastel, and looking at Nephi, invited her to sit down. The girl immediately sat down. Fall wanted something delicious, and Raphael also decided to leave with Zagan's permission. He allowed it. The man grabbed Fall by the collar of her dress, and she wanted to stay here a little longer. And Raphael said that it was time for her to learn how to capture the atmosphere, otherwise the gentleman would give her a beating. The girl told him that he was the last person she wanted to hear about atmosphere capture from. Zagan blushed, but invited Nephi to sit closer, pointing to his lap. The girl told him that it was a terrible shame to do such a thing here, he understood it too. Nephi said he embarrassed her too often, and he told her that he just sees a new side of her every time. The girl was even more embarrassed, saying that it was not fair. The girl's ear began to tremble, and the guy poked it to stop. The girl screamed, and he immediately began to apologize, because he was just interested. Nephi thought he was interested in her ears, and Zagan replied that this was the strongest part of Nephi. She was even more confused, but said that if he liked it, then she didn't mind. Zagan was shocked that he really could. He sat down opposite her and said he was going to touch them. Nephi agreed. The guy took the girl's ear and realized that they were so soft. He couldn't feel the throbbing of the arteries, however, the more nervous she became, the harder her ears became. The girl raised her head, and the guy immediately began to apologize, thinking that he had hurt her. But as it turned out, it was just the first time she was touched for them, and she was embarrassed. And all the people were looking at them and everyone had their own emotions. The guy and the girl immediately jumped away from each other and were silent. Nephi said that next time they would make sure they were alone. Zagan was shocked that he would be able to touch them again and he realized that she wasn't disgusted, however, he didn't think he could hold back if she did it again. Suddenly he realized that he hadn't told her that he liked her and needed to keep things in order. Someone came up from behind, surprised by their actions. It was the boy from the box who talked about harmony in their relationship and asked for permission to pour him a drink. But Zagan told him to get out of sight. 
The boy only wanted to serve Lord Zagan and his companions, and he would certainly be glad if he would take him as an apprentice after seeing all the work. He wouldn't even be scared if Zagan considered him a mere servant. Nephi decided to tell about the case. Zagan also clarified this, recalling that this conversation was interrupted by a boy. Nephi continued that she had recently been attacked by a girl in Kyanida. She didn't know if she obeyed the demon lord or not, but it was clearly not an easy magician. Without finishing, the fog appeared on the ship. The girl did not understand what was happening, because she did not even see anything. The girl couldn't make a sound. She also couldn't move. The fog began to clear, and the boy ran up to her. He thought something had happened to her. Nephi saw that he could move and realized that only she was being held back. And if it had been a simple spell, then Zagan's magic would have consumed him. The boy did not understand what was going on, but he would do everything to protect Mistress Nephi. The girl realized that this was a power that even he could not absorb, something like witchcraft. She understood whose handiwork it was. Zagan was worried about the girl, and she was glad that he was safe. But there was another Nephi in front of him who didn't understand what had happened. Nero and Nephi were shocked that there were now two Nephi. The boy did not understand how this was possible, and he could not break through. He realized that they couldn't see or hear them. Another said that she was surrounded by some kind of fog and was very scared. Nephi realized who it was. She repeated everything after her and even snuggled up to the couch like her. The guy pushed the girl away, telling her to stand behind and it looked like they were attacked. The boy realized that he considered that Nephi to be real and it so happened that a copy was next to him. The real one started shouting towards Zagan that it wasn't her and she wanted him to understand it, but she couldn't even lift a finger. Meanwhile, the other one said that she was cold and scared. She asked for a hug, and the real Nephi didn't want to see it. Zagan grabbed the other by the cheeks and realized that she was not his girlfriend, because for someone he saw for the first time, she was too close to him. The girl began to turn into herself and did not understand how he understood. Zagan didn't understand what she was talking about, but it dawned on him that she was trying to impersonate Nephi. He began to say that the girl did not even try to pretend to be her, because they were similar only in appearance and of course, he was able to distinguish them. She realized that he had figured her out. Zagan noticed something and swung to strike, saying that they would stop hiding. He smashed the dome covering both of them, and both prisoners were happy and surprised at the same time. The boy tried to explain that he was trying to protect Mistress Nephi, but the guy thought he was still trying to deceive him. The boy screamed and an explosion occurred. The ship began to sink. Zagan hugged Nephi while standing on the sinking ship. The guy apologized to her, thinking that he had scared her. But the girl started crying because he was able to recognize her. Zagan thought she was just glad she was finally safe. Someone started laughing, because he was merciless as always, and he was confident in his acting. Suddenly, the ship returned to normal, and the unknown did not understand at what point he understood. Zagan replied sarcastically that he really thought that some boy without magic would be able to get to the Lord's Ball, which is well guarded. The unknown realized that there was a smoke in his legend, because he really made a mistake with her. The unknown decided to introduce himself, he was the lord of the Bifron's demons and on this wonderful evening, he welcomes them aboard his ship. 